morning, everybody. Uh, my apologies for being late. There was train problems. Um, good morning, and welcome to this hearing of the New York City Council's Committee on General Welfare. Today, the committees will examine Outreach NYC and barriers to shelter for those experiencing homelessness. And the committee will be hearing legislation which addresses accommodating pets in DHS shelters and improving access to rental assistance vouchers programs. In November 2019, the de Blasio administration announced a new initiative, Outreach NYC, to address street homelessness by training 18,000 city employees across five agencies, including the Department of Sanitation, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the Fire Department, and the Department of Buildings and the Parks Department on how to use the 311 app and all of its platforms to submit service requests related to individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness. The submitted service requests will be filtered through the newly established Joint Command Center, which is an interagency partnership led by DHS, NYPD, and other relevant city agencies to address the unsheltered homeless on the subway. Interagency staff will analyze trends, triage requests, and prioritize and deploy multi-agency responses as appropriate. The committee seeks information on how this initiative has helped to assist with outreach and removing barriers to shelter for New Yorkers who are experiencing homelessness, and what the allocated resources for this initiative consist of. Two of the bills before the committee today, intros 1483 and 1484, aim to reduce barriers to shelter by better accommodating those experiencing homelessness with pets. DHS-run shelters don't currently accept pets, despite successful models from around the country that facilitate co-sheltering with animals. The experience of homelessness is traumatic and challenging enough, and the prospect of parting with a pet shouldn't be a contributing factor to such hardship. The committee will also hear intro 1902, a bill that expands access to case management support for anyone who receives an assessment and who is believed to be living on the street. The current process to receive case management is confusing at best, with many of those living on the street believing that they must be cited a certain amount of times by an outreach worker to receive case management. Another bill we are hearing today, Intro 1903, will reduce the amount of time that those experiencing homelessness on the street need to receive case management services in order to be eligible for certain rental assistance programs. I hope that the four bills that I'm sponsoring today will get us a little closer to removing barriers to shelter and permanent housing for those living on the street. And I hope that we can identify other areas where concrete steps can be made to get people indoors. I want to thank all of the advocates that are here today for sharing, and in uh, and, and particular, individuals that have experienced homelessness uh, for sharing your experiences. And I want to thank representatives from the administration um, for joining us today. And I look forward to hearing from you on all these critical issues. I'd also like to acknowledge um, Councilmember Bob Holden is here, and we expect other members of the community to be joining uh, throughout the hearing. Um, and I'd like to thank Committee staff, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analyst, Natalie Omery, Policy Analyst, and Frank Sarno, Finance Analyst, as well as my staff, Jonathan Boucher, my Chief of Staff, and Elizabeth Adams, my Legislative Director. And now I'll turn it over to Counsel to the Committee to swear you in. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to Council Member questions? You may begin. Good morning, Chairperson Levin and members of the General Welfare Committee. My name is Molly Park, First Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Homeless Services. Joining me today is Aaron Drinkwater, Deputy Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Legislative Affairs for the Department of Social Services. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today about Outreach NYC and our comprehensive HomeStat program. Outreach NYC is one element of the recently announced six-point action plan to end long-term street homelessness in New York City over the next five years. This administration is proud to be leading the nation in efforts to end long-term street homelessness, and we welcome this opportunity to discuss components of the journey home. In November, 
Mayor de Blasio announced the launch of Outreach NYC, a new citywide multi-agency effort to help homeless New Yorkers across all five boroughs. This initiative builds on historic investments in Homestat to mobilize thousands of frontline agency staff to request outreach assistance via 311 when they observe individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness. The goal of Outreach NYC is to help more unsheltered New Yorkers transition off the streets and subways into transitional and permanent settings. By training staff to submit service requests for outreach assistance, city agency employees are engaged as essential partners in our ongoing 24-7, 365-day outreach effort by helping us deploy targeted homeless outreach teams in real time. So far, the city has trained 500 staff from the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, largely environmental health inspectors, 500 staff from the buildings department, building inspectors, 1,100 parks workers, 300 community service associates, 500 maintenance and operations supervisors, and 1,000 department, and, and 1,000 Department of Sanitation supervisors, and 15,000 FDNY staff, including 11,000 firefighters and 3,000 EMTs and paramedics, to submit service requests through 311. Outreach NYC builds on additional enhanced enhancements to street outreach announced over the summer. All service requests, including those from Outreach NYC, are routed to the city's Joint Command Center, managed by DHS and NYPD, where interagency staff triage requests, prioritize and deploy multi-agency responses as appropriate, and analyze trends with a goal to provide collaborative assistance to the more challenging cases involving high-needs individuals. Through Outreach NYC, DHS, DSS and our sister agencies are leading by example to help our homeless neighbors to make the journey home. These engaged city employees contribute to the utilization of new resources such as the Joint Command Center, a new approach that increases operational and outreach efforts. The JCC deploys additional DHS outreach workers to address the most challenging cases of unsheltered homelessness. These cases involve high-need clients who often face the most significant and overlapping challenges, including mental health diagnoses and substance misuse. The Joint Command Center brings relevant agency experts to the table to develop tailored approaches to engage each individual based on their unique needs. Homestat outreach teams are coordinating with agency partners to address the needs of a specific subset of individuals who are confirmed to be experiencing long-term unsheltered homelessness, are known to outreach teams and meet a set of designations such as service resistant or medically vulnerable as an indication of greater need requiring more interagency expertise. Through close collaboration with partners including the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and Health and Hospitals, we are developing targeted interventions on a case-by-case -case basis to make the breakthroughs that encourage these individuals to finally accept services and tra transition off the streets and subways. As I testified to last month, under the Journey Home, a strategic plan that encompasses the operational structures of the Joint Command Center and Homestat, we are investing in housing, mental health and medical services for more unsheltered individuals, as well as enhancing outreach resources to deliver more urgent and rapid responses to unsheltered individuals in need. Our current strategies have helped more than 2,450 2, individuals come off the streets and into transitional programs and permanent housing since the launch of Homestat in April 2016. By marshalling new and, critical uh, new and critical resources, the Journey Home Plan will increase safe haven capacity by opening 1,000 new safe haven beds, increase create a thousand new low barrier permanent apartments by working with partners across the housing and social service sectors, deliver new health resources to people where they are, providing treatment through street medical care and behavioral health care, and building the trust needed for clients to come inside, provide coordinated rapid outreach response through the Street Homelessness Joint Command Center, leverage state-of-the-art outreach technology to better connect clients to the services they need to transition into housing, expand diversion and outreach in our subway system. Further, the Journey Home Plan builds on the nation's most comprehensive street outreach program, the Department of Homeless Services Homestat Initiative, with outreach teams canvassing the five boroughs and engaging New Yorkers who are unsheltered 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Through Homestat, hundreds of highly trained not-for-profit outreach staff, including licensed social workers, canvass the streets, proactively engaging New Yorkers experiencing street homelessness. 
Outreach workers offer services and assistance while working to gain trust with the goal of addressing the underlying issue that may have caused or contributed to street homelessness in order to ultimately help these individuals transition off the streets. Homestat also provides aftercare services, continuing to work with individuals as they make that transition to ensure that they get the supports they need to remain in housing and off the streets. Since 2014, the city has redoubled outreach efforts through through Homestat, we have tripled the city's investment in street homelessness programs from approximately 45 million to more than 140 million before the additional investments for the journey home. Tripled the number of safe haven beds dedicated to serving street homeless New Yorkers citywide since 2014. As of this year, there are approximately 1,800 beds dedicated to street homeless New Yorkers operating citywide. Tripled the number of outreach staff from fewer than 200 in 2014 to now nearly 600 through the Journey Home Plan that builds on the doubling of outreach staff through Homestat. Built the city's first ever by name list of individuals known to be homeless and residing on the streets to improve delivery of services to help them come off the streets. Outreach teams now know approximately 1,800 homeless individuals by name and actively engage another 2,400 individuals encountered on the streets to determine whether they are homeless. Increased joint outreach efforts with the operations with the NYPD and partner agencies such as New York City Health and Hospitals, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the FDNY Emergency Medical Services, and the Department of Parks and Recreation to engage more New Yorkers and offer more supports. The Journey Home builds on these investments, adding another $100 million in annual budget authority, bringing the total to $240 million. Among other initiatives, the spending will increase by 1,000 the number of safe haven beds dedicated to serving street homeless individuals available to Homestat outreach teams, bringing the total of these beds to 2,800 citywide, and will provide permanent housing for 1,000 New Yorkers experiencing street homelessness by creating a new low-barrier permanent housing model to meet clients where they are. Homestat works by building trust person by person. Our outreach teams remain focused on persistent, proactive, positive engagement, offering services and supports to New Yorkers in need 24-7, 365 days a year. Accepting outreach, services, uh, ex accepting outreach efforts, including services that will help homeless New Yorkers transition indoors from the streets or subways, is voluntary. And in accordance with the New York State Mental Hygiene Law, street homeless New Yorkers cannot be involuntarily moved from the streets unless they are posing a danger to themselves or others. Unsheltered individuals residing underground often face uh, complex layered challenges and may be resistant to accepting services, but our teams remain undeterred in their efforts to help them transition off the subways. To that end, Homestat outreach teams have access to licensed clinicians who work with clients on the street, providing ongoing case management and assess each individual for immediate risk and crisis during each encounter. Psychiatrists who for, perform psychiatric evaluations on the street as needed, helping understand and better meet the individual needs of each street homeless in New Yorker. Substance use resources, including ability to immediately connect individuals to detox and other rehabilitation programs, and are trained in naloxone administration. There are two bills that are pre-considered at today's hearing. The first would amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to the provision of case management services for homeless individuals. Experienced outreach teams from not-for-profit service providers canvass the five boroughs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year as part of our citywide efforts to identify and engage individuals who may be homeless, encourage them to accept services, and ultimately help them transition off the streets. With no one-size-fits-all approach to ending homelessness, the by name list enables Homestat outreach teams to more effectively engage each of these individuals on a case-by-case -case basis, person-by-person -person basis, directly and repeatedly. Outreach teams meet individuals where they are and evaluate the immediate and root causes contributing to their homelessness. Nearly 600 not-for-profit outreach workers are engaged in developing the unique combination of services that will enable individuals to transition off the streets and build the trust and relationships that will ultimately encourage these individuals to accept services. In their ongoing efforts to offer services, supports, and a helping hand, Homestat outreach teams have access to licensed clinicians who work with clients on the street, provide ongoing case management, and assess each individual for immediate risk and crisis during each encounter, psychiatrists who form psychiatric evaluations on the street as needed, substance use resources, uh, we support the intent of this bill, but we want to make sure that the requirements of the bill do not result in a return to one-size-fits-all approach that does not work. We look forward to working with the sponsor. 
the second pre-considered bill would amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to rental assistance eligibility requirements for New Yorkers experiencing street homelessness. In the Journey Home, uh, released just in December, we reiterated our policy that a shelter stay is not a requirement for unsheltered individuals working with outreach teams to qualify for rental assistance. From the moment our teams engage individuals experiencing street homelessness, they are working to identify the root causes of homelessness and what customized approach will get that individual connected to care and services. This includes pathways to permanent housing, which might include rental assistance, supportive housing, or a new low threshold model as a first step to bring someone inside. We look forward to working with the sponsor to ensure the needs of individuals experiencing unsheltered homelessness are provided the resources necessary to get back on their feet. Again, we want to make sure we are not cre recreating a one-size-fits-all approach. We think that our current policy in terms of eligibility for rental assistance strikes the right balance, particularly as we bring on additional safe haven and other permanent housing resources. And of course, shelter is always offered and available to bring people inside at any point. In addition, we urge that the focus at this time continue to be on the developments in Albany where there is broad support in the legislature for home stability support that would provide significant funding for state rental assistance to prevent and alleviate homelessness all across the state. And as we testified last week at a council hearing on other legislation, we need to be laser focused right now on addressing a $1.1 billion proposed state cost shift to New York City for the Medicaid program and a $102 million state cost shift over two years to New York City for the TANF and EAF programs, all of which would signif limit significantly our ability to sustain our existing programs, let alone develop new ones. The other two bills being considered today relate to the accommodation of pets in shelter. Introduction 1483 would require the agency to develop a plan to accommodate pets of homeless individuals and families in the shelter system, while Introduction 1484 would require reporting on the placements of pets whose owners enter homeless shelters. We applaud the intent of both of these provisions. It has been our longstanding policy to permit service animals as needed. Regarding pets as distinguished from service animals, we appreciate their importance in people's lives, particularly the support and stability they provide. At the same time, we must be mindful of the physical limitations of the haphazard shelter system we inherited, where many locations may not be effectively designed for pets, and recognize that the one-size-fits-all of the past doesn't work. That's why we issued our Turning the Tide plan and modernized our open-ended request for proposals to transform our shelter footprint, develop new approaches, increase the options available to those we serve, and raise the bar on services we provide. We encourage our not-for-profit partners to propose innovative new shelters and safe havens based on the real-time needs clients may be experiencing on the ground, including pet-friendly locations. We have been actively encouraging our partners to propose pet-friendly sites. We will continue working with partners to find a way to accommodate the various specific needs of clients with respect to pets. Outreach NYC is just one example of how we use every tool at our disposal to help New Yorkers in need get back on the path to stability. Homelessness is a moral challenge for our city that demands everyone, everyone's attention and action. As public servants, we all wear one uniform and are working collaboratively to identify unsheltered, homeless, unsheltered New Yorkers and mobilizing resources to help. Through Homestat, by strengthening engagement, building trust, and providing more pathways off the street, DHS continues and builds on our efforts, which have already helped more than 2,450 New Yorkers come off the streets and subways and into transitional programs and permanent housing. With compassionate frontline public servants acting as additional eyes and ears, helping our Homestat teams further target their outreach and meet people where they are, we remain squarely focused on taking this progress further. Thank you, and I would be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, Am I allowed? No, no. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. There's a, a, there's a, um, a time for a public testimony um, after the administration yeah. testifies. Um, and if anyone has public testimony, they should fill out a, a slip with the sergeant at arms. Um, Okay, thank you, Commissioner. Um, I want to start with um, uh, what has worked in the past. Um, so uh, this administration in 2014-2015 worked with the federal government at the time to reduce the number of veterans uh, who are on the street to functionally zero. Um, can you speak a little bit about that process and what worked there? 
Uh, sure. So that was, I think, much like the efforts that we have with uh, street homelessness now, a very extensive interagency effort that was really focused on on really person by person services. So at that time, uh, with veterans, we were working very closely with the uh, veteran services team, um, also with HPD. Um, you know, slew of other agencies, the healthcare agencies, to try and identify who needed services, um, what housing options were available with them. Similarly to as we're doing now, we were experimenting with new housing models. Um, we're able to use supportive housing. We're able to use the existing affordable housing stock for people who didn't need the same kinds of intensive services. But at the end of the day, people arrive at, at a state of homelessness through many different paths. There's very, um, people have very specific and personal needs. And so we, we need to marshal all of those city tools, but we also need to work with clinical partners to make sure that we are addressing people where they are. Okay, but, but what specifically was, was the most effective part of um, reducing the number of the veterans on the street? What, what was the, I mean, uh, what was the, the, the real catalyst to make that work? Because it, veterans, like any other population, have, may have individual challenges. Um, uh, it, was, it was done within a relatively short period of time, um, and so it was probably showing success um, probably within a few months of the program being rolled out. So. So I, I think there are two things that I would call out. One is that there were there were and are resources that are specifically available to veterans, right? So the VASH Section 8 vouchers, for example, are an incredibly okay. important tool. Those are specifically targeted to veterans as per federal regulation. Just to fill us in, what is a, what is a HUD VASH voucher? It, uh, it is a form of a Section 8 voucher that is specifically available to veterans. Um, how do they? Honest. How is it? Um, how is it administered? How does somebody can somebody get a VASH voucher from the street? Um, they need to be connected to both a housing authority that has an allocation of VASH vouchers mm -hmm. and to the Veterans Administration. I believe, although we can confirm this, that they, they are specifically available to people who have been honorably discharged as well. Um, so, so that is a, a subset of veterans, but it is an it is an important resource that is available specific to veterans. Of the Veterans Administration also provides uh, a range of services that are available, obviously specifically to veterans. So, I think the resources that were veteran specific had a lot to do with it. But I think the other piece that was was really important, and this is where I think we do absolutely see parallels to what we're doing with with streets. It is um, a very senior focus you know, from City Hall down, and that involved multiple agencies with everybody bringing the resources that they have available to the table. Um, you know, that is what it takes to solve a problem that is as nuanced as, as homelessness is, and I think that's what you're seeing with the approach to street homelessness now. And <clears throat> did, did all the veterans that got placed into permanent housing through that initiative receive a hot bash voucher? Uh, no, it wasn't 100% bash. Do you know what? I don't. Off the top of my head, we can follow up with you on that. Um, and, and I'm sorry, just, but in order to, re so a HUD VASH voucher, it's a Section 8 voucher, so it pays fair market rent. Yes. Um, it is permanent, so it doesn't, it's not time limited. Correct. Um, it's administered through NYCHA. Uh, both NYCHA and HPD have had VASH allocations over the years. Okay. Um, some are, some are administered by, by HPD, some are administered by NYCHA. Yep. Um, by the same, by the same offices that administer other Section Eight vouchers. Correct. Okay, um, and uh, and and they're able to be accessed. Is there is there a, do, does somebody have to move into shelter for ninety days um, in order to receive a a HUD VASH voucher, or can they receive it from the street through case management services on the street? They can receive it on the street, which. To be clear, is also the case with the city vouchers that have nothing to do with VASH. You do not have to come into shelter to receive a city voucher. Okay. Um, for a city FEBS voucher, you do not have to be in shelter. No. Um, so, 
With regard to um, Journey Home, just want to go through the, the individual um, bullets here. Um, <clears throat> and this is a, this is, this is what's going to be bringing the overall budget for, for street outreach to 240 million a year? Correct. Um, and it was 45 million in FY14? Correct. Um, so the first, the first bullet is increase the safe haven capacity by opening a hundred, a thousand new safe haven beds. The current number of safe havens is 1,800 in operation. Uh, safe haven and stabilization beds, yes. Safe haven. Can you just, for the record, um, identify the differences or the similarities between those two models? Uh, safe havens are specifically contracted facilities that are dedicated to people who have experienced street homelessness. They have a more, they have a quite intensive service model. Stabilization beds are um, paid for via the outreach contracts and have slightly lighter touch services. The emphasis at this point is on, on building the safe haven capacity. Mm -hmm. And stabilization beds are often in um, other types of facilities, so Correct. YMCA and, Correct. and Greenpoint, Correct. Um, YWCA in downtown Brooklyn. Correct. Um, and and th and how many stabilization beds are there? Uh, it's included in the eighteen hundred. We can get back to you with the split. Okay. Um, so, in, but the difference being that um, stabilization beds could essentially be uh, contracted. You know, they're, 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 if there's an SRO out there, which obviously there's not that many left, but if there are SROs, those those SROs can be contracted. They, those stabilization beds can be brought on through a, through a contract. Right. Where a safe haven has to be built out as a safe haven, right? Or it has to be a, it's a full site. Right. To, so to expand on the distinction a little bit, the, the stabilization beds are a shorter term resource. They may be a piece of an existing mm -hmm. facility using a building that is more or less already appropriate for the, for this kinds of residential use. Um, a safe haven, we are contracting for a minimum of a nine year period to use the building as, as a safe haven. It generally does require construction to do it and very often the building is starting um, as something quite different. So for example, we're uh, converting a yoga studio to a safe haven, so that, that involves quite a lot of construction in that one. Mm -hmm. um, so then the timeline for those thousand beds in safe haven what are we looking at uh the first project will come online in may and we have a steady pipeline after that to be completed um over the next couple of years okay. by 2024 i would expect so yes I, I i will caveat the construction schedules are sometimes subject to change but yes i would expect to be done by then um, now, how does DHS look at safe haven as a model when it, um, as a as a as a form of, of uh, uh, resource allocation or um, capacity um, in terms of and it, it, essentially safe havens are are not the most efficient from a from a management perspective um, uh, use of square footage basically that it's two people per room. Um, and you need a lot more space to have a thousand safe haven beds than a thousand beds in a congregate setting. Is that right? Yeah, safe havens are typically smaller, so you would have more uh, 50, 50 beds in a particular facility. The dorm, the, as you note, the dorms are smaller. It's two, three, four people per room, and sometimes including single rooms. Um, it's a service intensive model. So yes, they are not, from a strictly economic perspective, they are not the most efficient model, but we have found that they are very important to helping very vulnerable individuals come off the street, and we think it's an important part of the capacity. And what is it about safe havens that uh, people are more inclined to take up. I will tell you that when I talk to people um, that are experiencing homelessness on the on the street or in the subway, um, and I ask them if they want to go into shelter, they usually say no. Um, and if I ask them if they want to go, if that includes a safe haven, they usually say, well, yes, they'll take a safe haven placement if available. Um, so why is that? Why are people? Why do people want to go into a safe haven and not and not into regular congregate shelter? 
Uh, safe havens have somewhat fewer rules. Uh, you don't have a curfew, for example. Um, they have smaller dorms per, you know, sm smaller number of people sharing a room. As I say, in, in some cases, there's um, single rooms or two or three people in a single adult shelter. It, it does, it's a few more people per room. Um, it's a, it, it is a smaller setting. Um, sometimes people prefer smaller settings. We operate a large system. There are about 58,000 people in shelter on any given night. That does not include the safe haven numbers. Um, we work very hard to make sure that our shelters are high quality. We have invested more than a quarter of a billion dollars in this administration in improving services in shelters specifically. Um, Annually. Think, uh, yes. Um, the So investing in shelter quality and investing in the services and the physical condition of our shelters is something that has we have absolutely put our money where our mouth is um, for a specific population of people who have a, a long-term history of street homelessness safe havens are the better model so um i spoke to a man outside of grand central a couple of months ago um asked him how long he'd been on the street he'd been on the street for about 10 years um, in multiple locations. I said, have you, have you <coughs> uh, interacted with outreach teams? He said hundreds of times over that, over that um, period. And I said, would you go into a safe haven? And he said, yeah, I would go into a safe haven. So why, why would a man like that um, not be in a safe haven if he's been out on the street for 10 years and would take the placement? Um. I mean, I'm just, I know it's a hypothetical. It's a hypothetical. <laughs> then, why would that be the case? I think people people are facing a lot of very mm -hmm. complex challenges, and I think when you're talking about somebody who has been on the street for a decade, they have been failed by multiple government systems over over that decade. Um, and I think finding the moment where they are going to uh, trust and come inside is is challenging. Um, we want to be there when they do find that, when that moment does occur. That's one of the reasons why we think it's so important that we have a broad outreach perspective. Um, but but it, it doesn't happen always. And I think the same way it is, I can answer a hypothetical question. I think that individual was also answering a hypothetical question that yes, in, in concept, they would be willing to come inside with the safe, to a safe haven, whether or not they're distrust of experience of government when that moment actually occurs, I, I can't speak to that. I think that that's something that... <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Um, as, as, as my colleague pointed out, um, we, we do, we're very proud that we've increased the safe haven capacity by about th uh, three times. We usually have a couple of vacancies on any given night. We don't necessarily have a vacancy in a specific location. One of the things that we're trying to do is make sure with this increase in capacity is make sure that we have the right vacancies in the right place. Um, just because somebody is does not have a home to go to at night does not mean they're not connected to a particular community. So we're trying to make sure that we have safe havens in a representative sample of communities so that uh, an individual can be in the neighborhood where he or she feels comfortable. And what's your average nightly vacancy rate for safe haven beds? It's a less than 1%. We do have some, but not a lot. We absolutely need capacity and we are committed to building it. Okay. Um, now, is this part of the 90 new shelters or is this a separate? No, these are separate. Okay. Um, so then a thousand beds, 50 beds a, a safe haven is 20 new safe havens on top of the 90 new shelters? Give or take, I, 50 is an average. There will be some that are a little, few, a little bit smaller, some that are a little bit bigger, but yes. Mm -hmm. um, and have you um, sketched out the siting plan for that and how that, how that will work? Um, we are looking particularly in areas where there is a where we know there is a need based on, on 
where unsheltered individuals are. I think we're particularly interested near end of line subway stations, which tend to be a place where there are higher numbers of people experiencing unsheltered homelessness. Um, but we're working very closely with, with our providers to identify sites. And we do have a strong pipeline at this point. Great, okay. If you have any, if there are any sites in my district, by all means, please. We will absolutely be in touch, I appreciate that. Um, Okay, moving on to the, the low barrier permanent apartments. What, is there a model yet? We're working on it. It's really, I'm really excited about it. I think um, what, what we heard from a lot of people was that um, supportive housing is a fabulous model. Um, as you know, I come from the housing background. I'm very committed to supportive housing, but there's also some real process to get into supportive housing. You have to have um, a fair amount of, of documentation and paperwork um, that that might not be the right op option for everybody. So we are thinking through what that would look like. Um, I think we are, we expect that it will be, um, Able, we will be able to provide medical services for those who need, um, that we're going to be able to, um, and that will not have the same level of, you know, documentation with the, of psychiatric disorder or substance use disorder. Um, 2010E. That, that, that is required for the 2010E. Right. So the, no 2010E. That is what we are planning at this point, yes. Um, and are there state or federal resources that uh, could be available? Uh, we will look under every couch cushion. At this point, this is something that, that we are trying to figure, we are working through city funding mechanisms. Okay, so no um, tax exempt financing or? Um, I, I think it would actually be counterproductive to try and use the, the low income housing tax credits because that would then just be taking resources away from supportive housing. The goal with the low barrier is to be additive to the stock. Okay, well, that's a thousand units. How, what's the timeline there? That's a, you have to develop a program, put out uh, an RFP, see what works. We'll be releasing an RFP for this spring. But we are trying to, we are looking RFP for- for all thousand units? Um, for the model, yes. Okay. Yep. Um, have you been in touch with, who, who do you anticipate um, responding to this? Uh, homeless uh, service providers or uh, housing providers? Um, there is a universe of, of not-for-profits that, that fill both of those spaces, and I think we're, we're talking to them, but I think we are, and we've been working very closely with the development and advocate community, um, and continue to, we continue to do so, welcome input, happy to talk to others. Um, the concept paper out? Uh, we're working on that, so okay. happy to talk to you. RFP goes out this spring, concept paper has to go out Yes. now. Very soon. Okay. All right, I look forward to seeing that. Yep. Um, uh, new health resources to, for people where they are. Um, so this is a big question. I, in talking to street outreach teams, I asked a street outreach team once, what, um, <clears throat> what do you think should be improved about this whole system? And they said um, that they send people from Grand Central over to Bellevue who have a medical condition. <clears throat> they go through Bellevue. Um, they go through the process at Bellevue and then they circle right back out back to Grand Central, and then they get, and then it, they're, if they get sick, they're sent back to Bellevue. These are people with chronic conditions, and there's a, and there's a, um, you know, there's a constant back and forth. And they said that the coordination um, with health and hospitals is um, is very lacking. Okay, a uh, couple of things in there that I'd I'd like to respond to. So the. The funding in the Journey Home Action Plan is to increase the contracts for our outreach providers so that they can expand the ser medical services that they provide directly on the street to clients. So uh, all of our outreach providers will have uh, the ability to do, you know, obviously not complex medical procedures, but provide basic uh, medical care to people without having to require that they come into the hospital. Um, most of them have some degree of that ability already. Um, like MPs or? Yeah, okay. um, with, with you know, doctor supervision and, and psychiatric access as well. Um, so, so that exists, it's not consistent across the different contracts, so the desire here is to both expand and make consistent across all of the different, the boroughs and un underground. Um, coordination. Like th I'm sorry, just that, that's, that is a, 
you've gone through the funding requirements for that to make it a competitive. I and mean, one thing that we hear a lot is that, you know, for social workers, it's very difficult um, to attract social workers to do um, work like this because <clears throat> it doesn't, it's, not, it's not a very um, lucrative uh, avenue for, a, for somebody with a social worker degree. It's very challenging work. We certainly understand that. Um, we've been working closely with the outreach providers, mm -hmm. the existing contracted outreach providers, to to model out what the initiative would look like. Um, and we we'll also talk to like Hunter's so school social work yep. and, and, you know, make sure yep. what, you know, talking to, to institutions that are graduating people with social, yep. you know, MSW. Help, helpful suggestion. Um, I also want to address the coordination with with H and H. That's been something that's been very important and that we've focused on a lot. Excuse me, over the last few months, um, we have built very strong relationships with with the H and H emergency rooms and the JCC, so that we are working very hard to make sure that when somebody is discharged from H and H, that we aren't discharging them to the street. That we are getting them to whatever uh, indoor facility is appropriate—a safe haven, a shelter, a drop-in center, whatever whatever is the best option for that individual. Um, the last thing I just do, however, want to point out is that Grand Central is not covered by DHS contracts. Right, no, it's covered okay. by, well, yeah, outside is. Oh, yes, but, but I, I, it, yeah. within Grand Central. I just want to be clear. I don't know whether this was inside or outside okay. Grand Central because it was like right on the sidewalk. <laughs> I, think it was, I think it was a BRC, okay. BRC staff. <clears throat> um, but I think that that's, that's um, well, that presents a different challenge, which is if DHS is not doing the contract inside uh, areas where large number of people are in the subway, you do the we do the subways. Subway. You just don't do grand the the transit uh, stations. The the sorry the Penn station. the Penn Station and Grand Central are subject to MTA oversight. They have contracts of their own, but they are not directly administered by DHS. So I just want to be clear about that. Okay, how is there a meeting of the minds? We absolutely collaborate with the MTA. There's regular meetings. We coordinate. Obviously, we have some of the same providers in those systems. So we are we talk we resource okay. but so BRC this, has the <clears throat> BRC has an MTA contract and a DHS contract correct okay. but the city has gone as as we've just been talking about the city has invested a lot in expanding contracts and expanding the resources that our contractors have to get people off the streets uh, the state is still where they are um, I've heard of an idea of um, having an FQHC somewhere located in Midtown. Um, is that something is, that is specifically designed or, you know, uh, available to um, people who are um, living on the street or in and around the Midtown area? Um, is, that, is that something that DHS would see as uh, helpful or beneficial? Or? Ha happy to explore it with you, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So there was a provider that had come to me about it. I could make sure that they're talking with you? Please. Okay. Um, and then, uh, did, are you familiar with, <clears throat> there was just a <clears throat> paper put out by NILAG about the need for medical respite, uh, medical respite beds? Um, um, I haven't seen the paper. <clears throat> I'm happy to take a look at it. I, it is something, that is also something that we are, are thinking and talking a lot about. Um, I think, you know, medical respite is is a term that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So, sure. and I and given that I haven't read the paper, I'm not sure exactly which meaning we're using right now. There's a there was a consortium uh, with NILAG and Montefiore and, and a, a few other hospitals that um, going back to the previous term. So, for in the 15 to 19 term, 15 to yeah, 15 to <laughs> whatever it was, the last term, yes. they were, um, they did a lot of work in terms of advocacy, and the, the paper that they just put out was, was in line with that work, um, and the speaker at the time when he was the health chair had a bill in to require um, the city to provide medical respite shelter beds um, for people with chronic conditions that need them. What we're hearing is from hospitals that they are discharging people with chronic medical conditions into drop-in centers, into congregate um, shelters, um, or, you know, 
people might end up on the street because and and it's um, for for people that they otherwise would their only other option is to keep them in the hospital, but they're not acute enough to be um, uh, to be admitted any longer. Um, they often do keep people longer in a bed just because. So these are conditions like um, uh, dialysis, um, uh, heart conditions, um, uh, cancer, uh, things that require you know um, oxygen tanks, things that require oxygen tanks. So things that are things that are uh, that do need some type of medical um, ongoing medical care. Um, you know the kind of the kind of care that uh, that uh, that Medicaid would cover under a home health care, um, um, you know, contract or, or provider, and but if you're homeless or in a congregate setting, it's certainly not appropriate for somebody to um, uh, uh, be receiving, you know, recovering from chemotherapy, sleeping on a cot in a um, you know, in a room with 40 other people. Just to be clear, we, that is not the model that we use in our, in our current shelters, that we do have dorms, they are congregate, but they are not 40 other people. But um, yes, I, I don't disagree with you. Um, I, I think this is, this is a need that we've heard as well. Uh, we have an office of the medical director. They work very, very closely with with H and H to make sure that when discharge does happen, um, that it is happening to an appropriate facility. Um, I think is there more that can be done? There is absolutely more that can be done. Um, I think we need this is an this is a place where I think we need more options for long term residential settings. Um, you know, there that kind of model that you're talking about is really almost a nursing home kind of setting. There are very few options there. Well, um, yes and no. I mean, they're, they're, um, so, so for example, Communal Life does have um, a number of beds that are providing that type of service right now. Um, and, um, but, but uh, what we hear is that there's a, a, a need for an increased capacity. So I would certainly recommend uh, reaching out to, to NILAG, which has done a lot of the work yep. on this. Help, helpful suggestion. It's something we're thinking about, and I will follow up. Okay, because it's kind of one of those things that I've, like, I was working on this last term, and I only have a year and a half left, so I want to get this addressed before I'm out. Great. Um, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Councilmember Holden, and then I'll come back for questions. Thank you, Chair Levin. Uh, a few questions. And by the way, thank you for your testimony and uh, your efforts. But I, I just want to bring up um, some, some issues and try to get some numbers. You said that you tripled the outreach um, from 2014. Um, to, do you have um, 600 individuals on the outreach? It's close to 600. To, uh, just to clarify, most of those are uh, contracted outreach providers. We work with a number of nonprofits, and they're the ones that have the majority of the staff. So how many will be out tonight in the subways? Just a, just a, how many teams? So the subway is about a third of all of the outreach. I, we can, I can get the exact number on that. Um, we have outreach above ground as well, of course. Um, and then, so, and the, it is 24 seven. So if you're talking about the overnight shift, I think it will be in the range of 50 or 60 people, but that is something that we can yeah. clarify. 50 or 60 there. people. And, I, and I'm, I'm concerned that, you know, very, uh, you know, you, you can come up with all these programs and catchy phrases and names and, but we don't, we're not seeing the results on the ground. Uh, I know that you'll say otherwise, but I'll give you some examples. My wife rarely takes the subway. She takes the express bus from our home in Queens. Because we really don't have um, subways, right? We have to take a bus to the subway. So my wife takes the express bus and pays for the hour and a half or so commute that takes, that's about seven miles away from her job uh, in Manhattan. So she has to pay extra for the, it's not your fault, but she pays extra, we pay extra, because she wants to avoid the subways. So the other day she took the subway 
because we had, we had a, a, a family function and she had to get home pretty quickly. Her commute, half hour by subway, she ran into two situations. One, a homeless gentleman gets on the, the car, in the car, starts screaming at all the women, going up to them, don't look at me, screaming in their faces, and you can't arrest me, you can't do anything to me. Don't look at me, screaming in their faces. She got out of the car. She goes in another car, because it would seem there was a seat, and got hit with, there was a number of homeless sleeping in the car. And this is, this is rush hour, where nobody was in the car, so she's had to get out of that car. She never takes the subways, but every time she does, there's a situation. <coughs> now, you may say that uh, we're, you know, we're out there, but the fact that we're not seeing a difference. I don't believe anything DHS says anymore. I don't. Because what we're, not, we're not seeing the results, and we haven't seen re the results with all the programs that you've, you've actually laid out here. Um, and we're sick of it. Uh, we're sick of, you know, I don't know how many psychiatrists are in the subway. How many psychiatrists are, are with the teams that are out there? Because you say it's, they have to voluntarily accept, uh, unless they're posing a danger to themselves or the public. Correct. Now, does this guy pose, this is today's paper in Daily News, does this guy pose a danger to the public? Did you, have you seen this? I, I have not read the article. Yeah, well, maybe you should. Because 151 times he was arrested in four months and he's in a shelter. The people around him are saying, he talks to himself, he screams at himself, he screams at other people. And I, don't, I, don't, I don't want you to address this individual, because I know you can't, but we're seeing this over and over again. Nobody's red flagging these individuals. And the, the question I have is, posing, what it, it's very subjective, posing a danger to themselves or others. So let me start by saying that since the start of, since 2016, when Homestat was launched, we have moved 2,455 people off the street into a in permanent placement, that it, majority of them into permanent housing and, and some of them permanently into shelter, um, right? So I, I would... Okay, I would like to right. counter the argument that we are not getting results because I do think that we are working very hard, our outreach partners are working very hard to make sure that we are providing a pathway off the street. Do you take the subways? And I do, every day. Okay, Did, have you encountered situations where you felt threatened? No. You haven't? The, I would, you haven't, wait a minute, you haven't fe felt threatened on the New York City subways? By, by a person experiencing homelessness? No, I don't think I have. have wow. I felt, have I felt You're threatened? You're probably the only New Yorker. Nope. No, no. No, no. No, no. Where I would like to go, where, where I was, was going to go with this is street homelessness, homelessness in general, is a function of very complicated macroeconomic forces, right? We are talking about the state of the housing market. We're talking about the state of criminal justice policy. We're talking about the state of, of mental health policy. We are talking about growing income inequality. All of those things have to affect the number of people experiencing homelessness, whether it is street homelessness or, or homelessness within the shelter system, right? So I, I want to say that the fact that there are still people experiencing street homelessness is not a function of the success or lack of success of the outreach teams or DHS's work. We absolutely, we have more to do. That's why we launched the Journey Home Action Plan. Um, we, it is the most aggressive plan in the country to address long-term street homelessness, but I do think it is incredibly important that we place this problem in the context of the larger forces that we are dealing with. Um, with respect to uh, your question about when an individual is a danger to themselves or others. Um, this is a determination that has to get made by a licensed medical professional. So uh, it could be a is generally, in, in most cases, when this does happen, one of the nurses that works with the NYPD, um, but it could also be one of the uh, psychiatrists working for an outreach provider, it could be an H&H &H doctor. Um, they have to be, it has to occur. So the outreach team doesn't have a, a medical person, a qualified medical person to do that? 
They have on, to go. On, we have to go to another step. So if I could finish what I was saying. Well, you never um, answered my original question. I'm, I'm working on it. No, psychiatrists. How many are psychiatrists are uh, working? I don't have yet? that exact number. We can get back to okay. you with that one. All right. um, no, not every outreach team has a psychiatrist with them. The, um, as much as that might ultimately be desirable, that would be a, a incredibly challenging lift in the con particularly in the context of the the state budget cuts that we are looking at um, what we have is we the outreach teams work closely with the city outreach workers and with the NYPD um, in order f when an individual is identified in crisis um, where there is a concern that is the, uh, that individual is a danger to themselves or others um, a licensed medical professional one of the nurses, a doctor, a psychiatrist makes that determination. Um, and then with the PD, this can only, uh, uh, removal can only happen in conjunction with the PD, that individual is transported to a hospital for assessment. Um, it's not a decision we take lightly. We also need to respect people's civil liberties. Um, but, but we do do it when we feel like there is a moment of crisis. So how many individuals and this could, uh, and I don't know you probably don't have the number offhand, but I'll ask it anyway. How many were involuntarily removed and given shelter because they, they were actually, they posed a danger to themselves. It was determined that they posed a danger to themselves or the public. I don't have exact numbers, but I just want to clarify, nobody is involuntarily removed to shelter. If so, if there is an involuntary removal, they are taken to a hospital for a, an assessment. Okay. Um, shelter is voluntary. Fair enough, fair enough. So we can we get that number, how many were involuntarily, and how many times was Kendra's Law applied, which is a tool where we can get them medication, we can get them help. Um, and I know last time you said we don't, we really don't do that very often, but there is, there is Kendra's law for a reason yep. on the state law on the books that can help individuals because they, they you know, you can petition the courts to, to have them take their medication and uh, outpatient basis. And if they don't take their medication, if they continue to pose a danger to the public, they can be committed, which they should be. I want to emphasize that the vast majority of people experiencing homelessness, whether it's street homelessness or, or sheltered homelessness, are New Yorkers who have fallen on hard times, right? We um, Listen, I, I don't need the soapbox. I, what I need is answers to questions, individual questions that I'm, a, I'm asking, because we're not seeing a difference. At least in my, in my perspective, I took the, uh, the subway. When I take the subways, I always see an issue always see it. Almost every trip that I take, there's an issue with the homeless. And I keep seeing money being put toward it. I see uh, efforts, you know, a lot of money being put forth. I see that BRC is not, supposed, is not doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that's not me. That's the state controller. That's also Scott Stringer. That's a number of individuals. I see uh, so many not-for-profits that are not doing their jobs, and yet the uh, Department of Homeless Services is clueless to it. So uh, I, I think with respect to the BRC and the state controller's audit, I think this ties back very much to the point that I was just making about the larger factors that are driving the trends in homelessness. Um, one of the things that the, the controller called out was, was the extent to which BRC had or hadn't affected the number, total number of people who were on the street at any given time. That is a number that we, DHS, had determined was not an appropriate metric for the contract because homelessness, the number of people experiencing homelessness on any given night is a factor of all of the met macroeconomic factors that I laid out already, and I think it is frankly beyond the capacity of one individual not-for-profit organization to solve census problems by themselves. So uh, let me, let me um, so if I scream at, if I have, I'm a homeless uh, man, I walk into a, into a subway and I scream at pe in people's faces and I yell at them and I said, don't look at me, don't look at me, and I start doing that. Do I pose a danger to the public? I mean, I know you're not a, you know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna say, well, I can't, I can't determine that because I, on an individual basis, but do, would you say that is posing a danger to the public? The determination of who's posing a danger to themselves or others needs to be made by a licensed medical professional. And I right, but do we have guidelines for that? 
that is it is a it is a medical diagnosis and that the guidelines the state law states that it's danger to self or others as determined by a licensed medical professional to bring them in for a further assessment to determine what their medical needs might be. Yeah, because I, I want to know how many people are brought in to a medical facility from uh, an, on an individual night. I, I'd like if we can get that number because I, whatever is being done, if a person just keeps refusing because they don't want to go into a shelter, and you said there's a 1% Vacancy rate on the safe havens? Yes. One percent? That means there's very little, and sometimes you're full? Yes. Okay. Um, we also, we can get a, a, a metric on that, like how many times that we didn't have enough space in safe haven, which I, I think with 1,800 beds and all the number of homeless out there, we should have a lot more than 1,800, and we should fill a lot more than 1,800. And we agree with you, we are adding another 1,000 beds. Right. Um, so if you can get, you know, I ask these questions and I, I always hear that you're going to get back to me and then nobody gets back to us. And that's a, an ongoing problem with DHS. It's the least transparent agency out there. I've been saying this over and over again. Um, it's very frustrating when uh, Children's Care Center with huge contracts, almost a billion dollars, uh, has to be taken over. And, 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 the, and DHS takes a year to actually uh, go to DOI with this. Um, there's a number of issues that, that I feel that like Kendra's law is not being used uh, enough, that um, posing a danger to themselves or others is not being uh, used. We hear from EMS workers that they, they get yelled at by hospitals because they take the homeless there. Uh, so we're hearing, it, we're hearing it from providers, we're hearing it from outreach people, we're hearing it from the homeless themselves who, are, who say the food is horrible, they can't... Uh, they don't want to go into the shelter. They don't want to go into a dormitory-style uh, uh, shelter, and I, I, would, I don't blame them. And we need, obviously, we do need more affordable housing and more supportive housing and more transitional housing, which we're not seeing enough of in this administration. And six years in, uh, it's just not happening. So I think we're at a point where New Yorkers are fed up and we need to see some action and not just programs, that, that new programs that are just uh, uh, go out there. On the, let me just get to the faith-based, because the mayor announced that, that we're in the faith-based faith -based, uh, programs. We're, see, we're supposed to see uh, more and more um, organizations get involved. How many to date? Has that been... We've, successful? Yes, we've had a tremendous response from the faith-based community. We're very grateful to them. They've been bringing us sites. We're assessing them. Um, several of the sites in our preliminary pipeline are come from faith-based organizations, and and we look forward to further working. How many them. How many have opened up in the last in, in the last month or so? I mean. Um, so safe havens almost entirely depend on construction Thank to you. be able to be to be ready to go. So there is a, a time period between um, the planning stage and opening. So the the first of the new safe haven capacity opens in May. That is actually not a faith based site, but we have a robust pipeline coming. So can you get get us a number that how many new? Because I had I that was my two years ago. I mentioned more faith based. I have a, a number of of buildings that are empty uh, from uh, faith-based organizations that we should be utilizing. I told the commissioner this over and over again. He opened up one in my district, and that's it, 15 beds. And I said, it's only at night. We can do it 24-7. We're still waiting. So I don't really see any urgency on DHS. I, my, the offer still exists. If the commissioner will come out, I, I think the commissioner is ducking me since I got on the committee. I haven't seen him. Um, but I'd like to ha invite him to my district so I can op open up smaller shelters for individuals, mostly men, um, which the community will accept, and we have faith-based organizations willing to accommodate them, but it's not happening. I'd like to think that as a 20-year veteran of city service, I can offer some content here. I apologize that the commissioner is not available. Thank you. That, that helps a lot. Um, however, what I would like to see, and let me just go to, can I go one more question? Sure. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, Nobody else here, so. Right. That's right. So, and I was here early, so. One, let's, let's talk about the, uh, 
the pet-friendly shelters. Are there any? Uh, at this point, we do not have any shelters that accept pets. All of our shelters accept service animals and emotional support animals. Uh, we have RFPs on the street for both shelters and safe havens that allow and encourage pet-friendly proposals. Um, I think from what I've heard is that, that there are some coming our way, but it is I don't have anything that I can When was the RFP? That. Because uh, how long has it been out there? These are rolling RFPs. I don't uh, have the exact date. The safe haven one is is due to be refreshed. We'll be re-releasing that. We've done outreach to to providers. We've done we've we've actively solicited proposals. Um, you know, I do want to emphasize that. This is not, as I have said in my testimony, this is not going to be a place where we're going to have one-size-fits-all solutions, um, both because much of the real estate that we have inherited is not going to be appropriate for animals, um, you know, might not have outdoor space, might not have the, the right kinds of um, of layouts, um, but also because while pets are incredibly important for some individuals and we do want to recognize that, um, there's going to be other people with either allergy or trauma issues related yeah. to animals. No, I, I understand that one size does not fit all, and we understand that. However, if you asked providers to offer pet friendly and it hasn't been, I mean, has it been a year? Uh, yes. Okay, so it's been a year and nobody's like come forward because. It's not a priority, right? We are happy to work with our providers. Um, it is important that the person who, the organization actually running the shelter on a day-to-day -day basis has the same uh, engagement and places the same importance on the animals as, as they do on everything else. Um, so we wanna make sure that the providers are the ones leading the charge on, the, on the, any particular site. Does the provider get any more money for uh, having uh, you know pet friendly shelters uh, the contract rates are negotiated based on the specific right. um, types of services that are provided at the shelter um, so it, so if it, a family becomes homeless what happens to their pets um, we will work with with individuals and families to make alternative arrangements we have absolutely done that um, the the rates that we see of surrendering of pets are very very low so it goes to somebody else in the family? I mean, I, I, they don't go into shelters then? Uh, not unless they are a support animal or an emotional uh, or a service animal. Correct. Okay. Uh, thank you, Chair. I may have a second round. If <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Um, sorry, I just want to get back to the faith-based question for a second here. So I distinctly remember being at an announcement with Mayor de Blasio in 2014 or 15 in the blue room with a bunch of religious people about faith-based beds and shelter and it was this big announcement and it was we were very proud to announce this partnership with our faith based with our faith-based partners and um, and then nothing ever happened with it and then I, when I asked, like a couple of years ago, like maybe two years ago, so 2018, hey, what was, what's the story with all those faith-based beds? Whatever happened to that? They said, ah, we don't want to do that. We went away from that model. We don't want to do the faith-based. So now we're announcing we're going to do faith-based. We announced it like the second, first or second year of the administration. So I think a couple of things have changed um, since that initial annou announcement. Um, one is we have a much more robust process and team for developing capacity. Um, they are able to work, you know, faith-based organizations are not real estate developers for the most part. They don't- They have a lot of real estate. They do have a lot of real estate, um, but they don't necessarily, nor is it their job to have the expertise to, to work through the process. Um, I know a lot of, I know a lot of, of religious people that have gotten really experienced at all right issue. terrific i'm happy to be wrong um but we have a much more robust team within dhs right now that is equipped to to go out to do the site visit to work through the the complexities of bringing a, a site online with a faith-based organization so we are in a better place to <clears> be able to work with the partners um, the other thing that I think is substantively different now is that we're particularly focused on safe havens, which as because they're smaller facilities are maybe a better match um, than, than more general shelter capacity. 
Okay, but it seems as if maybe we lost some time, and since time is, um, since nothing gets cheaper in this city um, over time, we maybe lost some opportunity as a result of that by literally like going back to what we said we were gonna do like six years ago. We are making terrific progress on the Turning the Tide plan. We have announced uh, 68 new shelters, opened 34. Uh, I don't think we've lost any time. I, I, I just have to disagree because it's, it's um, I mean, it's, that's a little bit deja vu. I mean, I was literally told we're not doing we're not doing faith-based, um, like just maybe a year or two ago. So we could leave it at that, but it's, you know. Same thing you um, uh, So do, uh, I'll ask a couple questions about uh, pets. Do, do, do we know how many people, well, first off, you know, there is a, there is a uh, pet-friendly shelter within the, D, uh, within the HRA system, correct? Correct. Just one? Uh, URI as a provider accommodates pets in their shelters. The one you're thinking of is PALS, which recently opened. Um, and do we track how many people? Is, there, is it called? <laughs> <here. laughs> Can we uh, raise the temperature a little bit? Thank you. Um, uh, do we know how many people have? Um, have turned or have opted not to go into shelter because of, of, uh, of pets, because they have pets they don't want to part with? Uh, almost by definition, that's not a knowable number because if they don't come into our system, they're not part of our system. Um, right, but outreach workers could probably, you know, if somebody says, I don't want to come in right. because I got my dog here. So, shelter, yes, yeah, sorry, I was thinking about the, the larger, larger system. Um, with respect to, to outreach workers and people experiencing street homelessness, we have absolutely worked very hard to make special accommodations for individuals um, and their pets. I would also say that it is our, our team's anecdotal in, impression, and I will freely acknowledge that we don't have quantitative data on this, but that, that pets are a larger piece of the puzzle that, you know, as I mentioned, we're talking about a population that has been failed by multiple levels of government over many, many years. There's a high level of distrust. Uh, the pet may be the proximate answer, but the actual um, issue is about why somebody might not be ready to come inside is substantially deeper to that than that. Um, that being said, we are actively soliciting proposals for pet-friendly safe havens um, and based on conversations that we've had with providers, say these are preliminary, they're um, not yet something that I can talk about, but I am cautiously optimistic that we are going to okay. see proposals going forward. And how about, um, how about family shelters? Because, you know, it's, it, if you think about it, uh, um, you know, a child, particularly during uh, a traumatic time in their lives, could be very attached to a pet. And if they are finding themselves... Um, you know, in a, in at the you know the prospect of losing that pet that could be that could add to that trauma. Um, so if URI is able to do it in the HRA system, have we sought guidance from them how they make it work? If they make it work, I mean, I'm assuming that they it's not disastrous for them because they're still doing it. Um. We have absolutely solicited pet-friendly proposals across the system. Talking to URI for some best practices is a good suggestion, and we will take that back. Okay. Yeah, I'm sure they'd. Ha I'm sure they would have something absolutely. to add. Um, because yeah, I I'm I do yeah I do worry about um, you know pets are members of your family. I have two cats. Like, if we went into shelter and like I had to tell my daughter that like we are giving up our two cats, like that would be very very problematic. You know, absolutely. It would be problematic for me. It would be really problematic for my daughter, you know. Um, so, um, so yeah, I would, I would, I would, uh, I look forward to working with you guys on, on, um, on getting to a good place on this legislation because I, I'd like to pass this quickly. Um, let me get back to, um, 
issues around um, sightings. What is the sighting policy uh, when it comes to street outreach teams in New York City? There is no formal sighting policy. Um, as you know, on any given night, about half of the people experiencing street homelessness are experiencing long-term street homelessness, and about half of them have a more um, have, are having a more episodic experience. They're either they're going to either come into shelter or they're going to reconcile with friends, family, um, and get come back inside. Um, that we have a lot of both uh, hope survey data and and also the experience of outreach workers to to back that up. Um, we are okay, so so half the people are experiencing. Is that would you say that half the people that are experiencing street homelessness are chronically homeless and half are episodic? Is that how you would describe it? Yeah, I mean, chronic is a very specific term of art that I'm actually definitively trying to stay away from, but so long-term is the term that I'm using, but yes. Okay. On, on any given night, that is that is the experience of what we <clears throat> see. Okay. Um, so we work, we want to make sure that we are directing our resources most directly to the people who are experiencing long-term homelessness um, it's a, because we want to encourage people to to reconcile back with their families and their communities when that's an option um, and because we always live in an era of scarce resources and we want to make sure we're directing them appropriately that being said our outreach workers have uh, many years of experience a lot of clinical expertise and we rely very heavily on that clinical expertise I think you know one of the things that I heard loud and clear when I was here last month and we were talking about the diversion program was the importance of making sure that we are approaching social services with a social service lens and respecting the expertise of clinicians I think this is a really good example of where that happens so when a not-for-profit outreach worker identify somebody that they feel like is in need of services um, they absolutely have the discretion to be able to to get that person to the full array of DHS services okay well first off I not the, the, the that breadth of clinical experience may or may not be there uh, and outreach there are probably plenty of outreach workers who you know don't have MSWs that don't have, I, I, I mean, what is the starting salary at uh, for an outreach worker? I don't have that with me, but um, I'm sure it's the, not seventy five thousand dollars. The organizations come with a lot of expertise. Are there places where we can invest in training? Absolutely, we're working really hard with our. I should be curious to know how many social how many social workers are within the kind of chain of command at the, at the but we, we, this, I mean, you we don't have to answer really, now, but, we really get back to you with that. But it's, I'd be interested to know because I, because I've been, I was having a conversation recently just about the, and this goes back to actually talking to a place like Hunter because social work tracks kind of go in, I, from my understanding, go in kind of different, a few different directions. One is through licensed clinical social worker uh, and then another is through kind of administrator, administrative. And so having, you know, being in a position of like being a uh, street outreach social worker is not a very appealing um, career course for a lot of people coming out of MSW programs. So I'm just wondering how really what type of, you know, there's first, I did that, that's just one issue I, I want to bring up. But then coming back to um, how we are, the, 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 there's a report by human.nyc, I don't know if you saw it, around sightings, um, where it's, <clears throat> what they're saying is uh, talking to people, everybody knows that there's, that there's some type of sighting policy, but nobody knows what that sighting policy is because there isn't really a policy. But they know that they have to have sight, they know they have to be seen and that the resources available to them are somehow dependent on being seen some number of times that is not uniform across the board that may or may not apply to them and it is <clears throat> there are like for example so so if you're a, a safe haven bed is not available to you if you don't meet a certain criteria correct uh no that's not correct we will we absolutely work with our outreach providers 
to make sure that if they have a client that they think is is in need of a safe haven bed, that they we will try and get that individual in. Understanding if that is, person it has is, never never been cited before. Well, can't uh, can't prove chronicity, can't prove long term. So so this is a place where this question of working with the outreach providers to say that this is an individual who needs that very scarce who resource. Who makes that decision at the outreach provider? The organizations have a have a clinical supervision structure that they are there, you know, the, the frontline worker is not going to be able to make that recommendation by him or herself. They are going to work with their larger organizational structure. Um, we work really closely with these organizations, talk on a on a regular the streets team talks on a regular basis with all of the providers. Um, we've been emphasizing very clearly that if there is if there is a client about whom they are particularly concerned that we are absolutely willing to work with them to get them to the particular to the right resources I do want to emphasize I'm just worried about the, the opposite actually I'm, I'm worried about because that allows for a certain level of arbitrariness I'm worried more about the person that they say for some reason shouldn't qualify for that and what what means of appeal then does a person that's living on the street have when they say, "Listen, I'm, I've been, uh, you know, I'm down and out. I could, I want to go into a safe haven. You're telling me I I don't qualify, but I don't know what the criteria is. And I don't know who appeal to." So, New York City is a right to shelter city. Yeah, everybody, no, everybody, ha everybody has the. I'm, <clears throat> for the record, New York City is a is a right to shelter city. Everybody has the right to come inside. <laughs> Um, we do not have enough sufficient safe haven capacity to bring everybody into a safe haven unit. We are growing our safe haven capacity significantly. Um, if somebody absolutely wants to come inside, we encourage them to do so. We will work with them. If it's not a shelter, it's a drop-in center. It's a the drop-in center. Is, you can't sleep in a drop-in center. You're sitting in a chair. Uh, understood. But there are many pathways to come inside, um, and and you know. If there is a client about the, that you were thinking of in this not, conversation, no, okay. no, I'm, I'm thinking about a hypothetical client because I know that they're out there, where they they want a, a safe haven placement, they have no idea what the criteria, and, and what you're saying is that there is no citing policy. Is there a definition of chronicity? Does it, does the definition of chronicity have anything to do with it? The, the federal definition of chronicity is nine months out of the last two years. And does that have anything to do with safe haven placement? That has traditionally been the definition for safe haven placement. But we it's are, not now. We are working with providers to make sure that when they have a client that does not meet that standard, but for whom they feel like this incredibly scarce resource is important, and I do want to emphasize that this is a scarce resource, right? We are adding the capacity. We think it's important. We are, we are very literally putting our money where our mouth is but to, to build that capacity. But if a client needs a safe haven bed for somebody that does not meet the federal standard, we will work with them. Okay. Now, does the federal standard have any, like, do, do, does it affect our rate of reimbursement on our beds? We unfortunately do not get any reimbursement on our beds. No reimbursement. Okay. So then we're not tied to that. Which is there, there, there's a handful of safe havens that do have have a limited amount of federal funding in it. It's not a reimbursement the way the family shelter system works. Okay, and that's not dependent upon meeting the, the federal definition of chronicity. At, at this point, we have enough city funded safe havens, limited capacity that we can do this on a targeted basis. Everything with safe havens is going to have to be on this targeted basis because the, of because we do have scarce capacity. But when there's 2,800 beds, we you know, will. That's not yeah. that scarce. We were talking. That's like about. That's you know how many how many individuals are are on the street. When we have 2,800 beds, I think we will be in a much better place to be able to meet the broader need. Um, I will say, you know, one of the things that we are doing as we are building out our. Um, streets team and launching all of the journey home initiatives is that we are assessing policies and procedures overall um, we have a new deputy commissioner for the streets team she is working very closely with all of the outreach providers um, working through best practices and if this is something that we want to formalize we will right now um, we think that the respecting the clinical expertise of the not-for-profits is is working relatively well but there's always room to look for improvement okay I mean, that's a, I mean, in some sense, it's a good answer that we don't get federal funding for these because then we're not necessarily, we can make up our own 
We can make up our own criteria. The, to be clear, and, and I should have been clear to begin with, there is some limited federal funding in the in the safe havens. Yeah, um, but not pro, not in a prohibitive sense. Not that, that doesn't it doesn't prevent us from creating our own we, criteria. We do have some flexibility within the confines of the fact that it's a very scarce resource that we want to direct to the people most in need. Understood. I just think that it's I'm I'm you know I am worried about the person that says I mean who, who do who, they couldn't appeal there. Say 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 there's somebody on the street. Let's use a hypothetical. And the street outreach worker says, you know, I, I, I put up the chain of command and they said, no, you know, you, you're not, you don't need it enough or something. What, what is the, who do they go to? Who do they appeal to? So we, ha we do have a DHS ombudsman that, that accepts complaints of a wide variety, um, you know, so how do they think, find the ombudsman? We can I don't think about ways ombudsman. we we can think about ways that we can make sure that that is that information is widely available. I'd also say that um, you know we very much respect the work that the advocacy community does and that the elected officials do. We have certainly gotten some of these phone calls from from your office about how do we connect a client to services. So um, we do work very closely with with partners to solve special cases. Yeah, I just, I'm not sure it's that special. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I'm, there's plenty, there's got to be people right. that, like, don't know an elected official that have right. this, like, We do not, we do not have a formal appeal process related to safe havens. It's an interesting suggestion, and we'll yeah. think about how we could do that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, we've been hearing this issue for a while, and, and I just think that there's a, um, I think that it, 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 there ought to be some level of kind of um, uh, standardization. Um, <clears throat> one of the things about safe haven capacity is, so obviously beds would open up if people were able to be placed into permanent housing out of safe haven. Um, what, what are the biggest challenges right now uh, to DHS placing people out of safe haven? Well, it's something we're focused on very closely right now, and we've seen a big uptick in the number of people moving out of safe havens and into supportive housing. Um, that's in part due to a specific allocation of 1515 resources and also working with our partners at the state from Ishai resources dedicated specifically to people experiencing street homelessness. Um, but we're also working to um, facilitate placements into congregate supportive housing as well. Um, so, you know, just we, we have seen a steady uptick in those numbers it it's um you scatter sorry you meant scatter uh both scatter and congregate um but i we do think that there it is something we need to do more of we're working both on the supportive housing side but also this the low barrier model that we introduced as part of the journey home i think will be helpful there mm -hmm. um what is the you know, I just did a little bit of math, and you said that we placed um, 2,455. Um, but that's over four years, and so that's, I, I averaged it out. It's about two placements, a little less than two placements a day. Um, do we have a target for the number of placements, like our, our kind of um, rate of placement? Uh, we don't have an official target, no. Um, I, I actually think that that is... That's a success. Um, the the two the 2455. Um, I don't know what we're talking about. Yeah. There's always room to do better. The fact that we have people on the street at all is is something that we want to address. It's why we launched the Journey Home Plan. Um, but you know, this is a, a population that's facing multiple hurdles to to coming indoors. That we really have invested in that, and we do see this this strong rate of people coming in and staying staying indoors. Yeah, I mean, going back to that, to the first question I asked, which was, why was that the the veterans initiative successful? Um, and it, and I think you realize this being coming from HPD, housing is that it was you know the big the big thing there was those VASH vouchers. That's what that's what made the difference because that got people into long term permanent housing. The, the you know I um, 
I mean, this gets into our whole conversation around um, uh, fair market rent on vouchers and, and, and why vouch some, why does a Section 8 voucher more appealing to a landlord? Why is it more effective? I was at a, I went to a round table a couple weeks ago with RSA. I was, uh, you know, with a bunch of eight, uh, 40 uh, RSA owners. These are small building owners. I'd say more than half of the people around that table were women. More than half the people around that table were people of color. 40 people. I asked how many people around this table take Section 8 vouchers. You know, a bunch of hands went up. 10, 12 hands. I asked how many people around this table take City Fest voucher. And one hand went up. And that person complained about how it's administered. So, um, you know, the reason why the HUD VASH works is because it's an effective voucher. I think you also point out something really important is that it's one instance where we have resources from the federal government. One of the reasons why we were able to bring that veterans number down was because we had investment at all levels of government. Yeah. Um, and that's critical important. It's why we're fighting for HSS. You know the story. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't want to not point that out. Absolutely. 100%. Um, 100%. Right. Um, and listen. But I would just say this. I just as a, you know, I do believe, and New Yorkers that are watching this on Channel 74 that don't agree with me, feel free to email me or tweet at me about it. I think that New Yorkers are willing to put in their tax dollars to solutions that, that work. And solutions, and in this context, the definition of what works is placing people into permanent housing effectively, efficiently, um, on a large scale, <clears throat> and I think that New Yorkers are okay with allocating their tax dollars, whether it's their local tax dollars, their state tax dollars, or their federal tax dollars, in that <clears throat> in the service of that. If they if they see that the number of people on the street go down because they're in permanent housing, not because they moved to New Jersey or Virginia, but because they're in permanent housing here in New York City, I think that that's a, that I think that they would you know. I, and again, if anyone on Channel 74 disagrees with me, you can I'm sure you'll let me know. Um, so. Um, so this administration has moved 140,000 people into permanent housing, right, through city vouchers, through um, HPD housing programs, moving people into NYCHA housing, right, that is obviously inclusive of people who are in the shelter system. It is it's not specific to streets, but we have a deep commitment to moving people into permanent housing. We are absolutely investing in permanent housing. Um, the other thing that I would say is really just to agree with you is that as we were drafting the action plan, the Journey Home Action Plan, and talking to people, one of the really guiding forces was, you know, outreach is good, but you need places for people to go, right? And so we have a thousand new safe haven beds and a thousand units of permanent housing, right? That is, it's. That is an enormous commitment. Um, it's not one that we have made before. I think it's going to be really important. Um, this is also, you know, this is an administration that has the largest municipal supportive housing commitment that's ever been made. The 1515 commitment is tremendous. Um, it, you know, I think there is a lot of efforts to to creating new pathways for permanent housing. Um, city has certainly invested a lot of resources in it. Um, don't disagree with you that permanent housing is the end goal, um, but I think to, to piggyback off of my colleagues' comment, where we can do it in conjunction with other layers of government, um, it, it is very helpful. Yes. HSS, uh, I think, would be very helpful in this entire equation, so I encourage my colleagues on the state level um, to please support that. I don't have the Assembly and Senate bill numbers offhand, but they know what it is. Yeah. I, I'm very hopeful that that gets um, addressed in this legislative session, in the budget session, be, be, before the end of next month. Um, Councilor Gredenchik, do you have questions? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I uh, apologize uh, for I had another committee commitment at the same exact time, so I started with education. Good morning, uh, Good morning. Still morning. Good afternoon, <laughs> uh, Deputy Commissioner Park. Um, you know, I, I think that this city's commitment to people who are homeless, and I, I don't even like to use that term, but um, is without parallel. Um, we are expending several billion dollars every single year. And at, at the education committee hearing I was at, we were talking about class size reduction. And while it may not be totally analogous to 
um, homeless services. Um, I, I remarked there that I felt that we were on a treadmill. I've been in government in Queens County for over 30 years, and um, we've been building new school seats for all that time. And it's, sometimes it's like trying to hit a moving target because people come and they go, and I hear from principals of medium-sized elementary schools, they can, their population go up or down 50 or 100 students each and every year. And I, I've said this to Commissioner Banks, um, that I feel that we're on a treadmill. I, I travel almost every day on the New York City subways. I'm an E-line rider generally. Um, I've seen a great increase. Um, my, my information is anecdotally, but um, there's no question that it's up. And um, I know we've had a hearing on that, but it, it just, um, I think we need, we need to take more beds. And I know that my colleague, uh, Mr. Holden, um, asked something along these lines before. Um, would it be helpful if we had more psychiatric help on the streets? I mean, is that something that we should be investing in? We are investing in additional medical care. Always happy to look at ways that we can grow that, given keeping in mind, however, the context of the you know potentially devastating state budget cuts that that are coming our way. Um, so I'm really glad we are we are able to lock in the increase in investment in medical care on the streets now, and and we can look at it going forward when we have a better, clearer picture of the state budget. Um, I want to take a step back, though, and talk a little bit about numbers. Um, on the families with children side, now this is, this is not street homelessness, this is people experiencing homelessness and staying in DHS shelters. The, the number of uh, families with children experiencing homelessness is actually down. Um, it's for the first time in decades we have seen a reduction in that number. Um, that's something that we've really fought very hard to do. It's both with the prevention efforts, um, I think, is it just the beginning of this week? Boy, yeah. it's been a long week. Um, we it's been a long month. <laughs> administration announced that, that evictions were down 41%. Yes. That's tremendous. Great. Um, it also has to do with the city for HEPs vouchers. You know, I mentioned we've moved 140,000 people out of the shelter, um, largely out of the shelter system using various city tools, including city for HEPs. Um, so there's a lot that we've done, and we've actually seen some, we've seen progress on the families with children's side. Um, the adult census does continue to increase, unfortunately, and I think that is a reflection of a lot of those um, very macroeconomic forces that I was talking about earlier. I think this may have been before you were able to join us, but um, you have widening income inequality, you have a real estate market that is, you know, we've lost 150,000 units of rent-stabilized housing over the last actually don't know the time frame on that, but, um, you know, decade or so. Um, we have, you know, a vacancy rate for low income, for, for less expensive units that is in the neighborhood of, you know, 1% or even below 1%. Um, we have, uh, you know, so you have all, you have um, state mental health policy, you have all these various factors that are outside the control of just New York City government that are shaping how we experience homelessness here in the city. And I think it's really important to keep those in mind when we think about um, trends. So the fact that we are down on the family side, we are, we are seeing fairly marginal increases on the adult side. Um, it's not where we would like to be long-term, but it is, it is absolutely progress. Of the, of the people that are living on the street and horrible condition. You don't have to go very far. You can go around the corner and, and see it right here. Uh, um, and it, it breaks my heart um, because, you know, it's not the way that human beings, anybody, you know, uh, should live. Um, and I just wonder um, what percentage of those people, if we had homes to put them in? I mean, I know we're building and, and uh, um, the city council and, and the mayor have been working very hard on that. Uh, what percentage of those people do you think you could get off the street if we had, you know, suitable housing? Um, great question. I think we, we certainly hope that the number is is all of them. Um, I do think, you know, people's issues are, are very complex. Um, what we know, and, and 
of any given of the people on the street on any given night, about half of them are really episodically homeless. That they will come inside either into shelter or or reunite with their families, with their friends, um, on a relatively short order. Um, for the uh, other half that are are long term experiencing long term street homelessness, um, it's a very complex array of issues. We um, safe havens are a really good model. We are expanding safe havens. Supportive housing is a really good model. We are investing in supportive housing and and low we the Journey Home Action Plan includes a thousand units of what we're calling low barrier permanent housing, which has a lot of the services that that might be similar to supportive housing, but excuse me, not necessarily all of the same uh, documentation requirements because supportive housing it's a fabulous model. I am not denigrating supportive housing in any way, shape, or form, but it does have some fairly significant um, documentation requirements to get in. So we are we are innovating. We are um, trying to learn from experience and create new models. Um, I, I do want to emphasize it because it, it ties to one of the bills that we're talking about today. Rental assistance is available for people experiencing street homelessness. You do not have to come into the shelter to access a city perhaps voucher. Um, whether or not an open market apartment is the right option for everybody, I think is it, it will be a useful tool for some. I think for more people, supportive housing is a better tool. All right, since the chairman's not here, I'm going to keep going. Um, you'll get you'll get your turn. Um, I have been a champion um, since I first read about it uh, in the newspaper of uh, Chair Andrew Hevesy's uh, home stability support. Could you talk a little bit about how that might help uh, us here in New York City? I, I know it would, but I would would like to hear your, since we're at budget time in Albany and we are um, desperately been trying to get this done, I know we have the chair also, uh, Chair Kruger is also supportive of this. Um, and I, I know that, um, we all know that the key to a better life starts with your apartment or your house and it ends there too. We couldn't agree more that this is an incredibly important bill. I'm actually going to ask my colleague who has been eating, sleeping, and drinking this to, uh, to, to respond. So we certainly appreciate your support. Um, the bill, the Home Have a C support, would inject necessary state resources, um, creating a portable statewide benefit. Um, it would allow us to then also supplement that benefit with a uh, city tax levy uh, to bring the voucher up to FMR. Currently, individuals receiving public assistance, uh, the shelter allowance associated with it hasn't been increased, I believe, it's since 1986. Um, so it is a wildly yes. inappropriate uh, level uh, to be considered. And so this would create, like I said, um, an additional resource from the state uh, for individuals, it would be portable. So if an individual was residing in New York City and should choose to relocate to Nassau County, for example, um, or from Rochester, moving around, uh, they would be able to do so, unlike the City for HEPs voucher, which would require somebody uh, to maintain their, their housing in New York City only. Thank you. I'm going to turn this over to uh, my, co my colleague, Bob Holden. Thank you, Acting Chair. I'm not <laughs> Um, I just want to echo what um, Chair Levin said about um, the faith-based um, uh, opposition that I experienced. When I took office in uh, January of 2018, I mentioned this to uh, Stephen Banks, the commissioner of DHS, that I have a number of locations in my district that are faith-based and they're willing. I, I check with some of the pastors. I check with some of the uh, the faith-based organizations, they were willing. Some of them are operating soup kitchens already. Some are operating um, uh, some, some pantries, food pantries. We have a very giving community, and we have a lot of empty buildings. Yet the commissioner put up one obstacle after another, why faith-based couldn't work. He said, well, there's so many building department issues within these convents or, or, uh, or, or um, schools. There, there we, we tried that, it didn't work. Then he said, um, then I offered one location, and he said, well, first he told me, we, you, we, we need a minimum of 20 uh, men. Then I went back to him, I said, I think I have one. Then he said, oh, um, no, we need, it needs to be 40, 40 men. I said, well, I don't think that church can, can handle 40, but they can handle 20. It's not cost effective, not cost effective. And you're only gonna give them they're only going to be there at night. 
I said, well, that's a start. It's better than being on the street. It's not cost effective. That's what he said, back and forth. We went on a year for the, with this. So it's disingenuous to say that, and then all of a sudden, a few months ago, the mayor announced, faith-based, we're here. We're doing it. Wait, wait, let me. And it's going to be bigger and better. And when he did that in 2014, we don't know what happened. He announced it then. And we lost years of people being out on the street or people in shelters rather than smaller faith-based, which the faith-based organizations were willing to help out. <clears throat> That's their mission, to help the poor. That, they were willing, yet we got barriers and obstacles. It wasn't cost-effective. So you'd rather have the homeless out on the street than in a faith-based. And I still have a lot of empty buildings. So and I still invited the commissioner to come and visit. And he opened up two sites, one, like I said, one in my district, and I offered 24-7 because he said it's only at night, and I, I still have, he hasn't taken me up on that. So, council member, it's absolutely true that some sites are cost-effective and some sites are not. As I mentioned, when we do a safe haven, it almost, it, you know, in almost every circumstance, um, I should probably actually say every circumstance requires construction. There is, there is not such a thing as, as really an off-the-shelf off safe haven product. So we do a lot of, of work when we, before Stop we Stop right there. We just opened one without construction. I asked the city council, the speaker's office, to give me 35000 We still haven't gotten it. He, is, he did commit to it. Um, but they're without construction or volunteer or the church agreed to get volunteers. But we can do it without construction. But we'd rather have them on the subways, or we'd rather have them on the streets, because it wasn't cost effective. So, so let me, let me, for the record, separate the different kinds of beds that we have. A safe haven is a dedicated facility that is designed, uh, that is, has been retrofitted or built for the particular purpose. It has a long-term contract, relatively long-term contract on it so that a not-for-profit will be operating dedicated services 24-7 in that, in that building. Um, the services are fairly intense, Those are, and they are specifically for people experiencing street homelessness. Um, the people may be there for uh, short periods of time or long periods of time, but they are, they are the facilities themselves are operating for, you know, it's typically at least a nine-year contract. Um, and as I say, on, fairly intensive on-site services. You, that there are various other models. I mentioned earlier stabilization beds. These are um, short-term. We might open them for the for the winter or something like that. That are where a not-for-profit will rent some rooms at a Y, for example. And then we have some church-based beds where a church volunteers in the church um, will will have cots that are open overnight. Um, those are are have loose integration with DHS programs. We are very grateful for communities that do that, but um, that is, when we're talking about safe havens, I do want to emphasize that we're talking about service-rich um, contract, DHS contracted facilities that are in dedicated spaces. Um, and there are, we, when we look at a site that is proposed for a safe haven, some of them are appropriate and some of them are not. Um, we need to make sure that the amount of rehab that we can do is, is viable um, from uh, both a, a cost and a, frankly, a feasibility and time perspective. Um, we're looking for accessibility concerns. You do ha absolutely have people with mobility issues. So there's a lot of reasons why a building might or might not be appropriate for a safe haven. But um, as I mentioned, we have identified um, several from faith that have been brought by the faith community. We continue to look at others. We are, um, and the, and this is specifically in the safe haven space. Um, all right. uh, let, let me just uh, touch upon uh, children community services. I know it's, uh, it's a sore point. It was initially a con $359 million contract to, to shelter homeless families in hotels and was awarded in June of 2017. Uh, to provide 1,210 uh, hotel rooms for families uh, under a three-year deal. Seven months later, DHS expanded that contract to 2,100 or so rooms uh, for nearly $600 million. The city paid approximately $500 million already to them. As you know, they were rated, Children's Community Services was rated on January 27th 
2020, this year. We, it was found out they used subcontractors that were connected to CCS. They used a network of at least six contractors that did not appear to provide supplies and services. Uh, one company was based in a vacant home. Another one, no, uh, they had another office in a po at a post office box in Nassau County, and a third operated out of a Harlem apartment. Um, rated by the New York City D DOI and, and federal prosecutors, um, the DHS waited until May of 2018 to refer this fraud to DOI. Despite refer referring this not-for-profit to DOI, DHS still awarded CCS two more contracts worth $21.3 million in October of 2018. Wonderful. Inspectors examined one hotel in the Bronx and five hotels in Brooklyn, uh, but their exact locations were redacted in the report. The operations by CC, CSS in both boroughs were hit with poor ratings. This is why people question DHS a lot. Um, so currently, 11,400 New Yorkers live in 89 hotel shelters, a third of which, 30, are run by CCS. Between 2015 and 17, the not-for-profit scored um, half a billion, more than half a billion, in homeless and shelter-related contracts. You knew that these were poor shelters, yet you still awarded, you knew they were having problems. You knew they weren't doing what they were supposed to do, yet you awarded them another contract. So and so we're, so we're supposed to believe that all this is going to change and we're going to have these great, great outcomes. When we hear complaints from not only the people that won't go into the shelters, people that are in the shelters are, are complaining about a host of other things, that they're not getting the services they, they deserve, and yet we're supposed to believe that these new programs that you're saying today and are going to be wonderful. So, council member, when I was here, we're in front of this, this committee in December, I was asked whether any not-for-profit was too big to fail. My answer was no, and I think this is an example of that. When DHS staff spotted problems with the organization, they flagged them. We put the organization on a corrective action plan. When the corrective action plan didn't work, we flagged it to DOI, um, and and have ultimately we took them to court to get a receiver put in. Um, I think you know it is the whole situation is is certainly unfortunate, but it is also an example of DHS doing absolute and staff doing exactly what they should have done to spot a problem and to rectify and, and award them new contracts, have, even though they were under investigation. I, I, we actually have. During that time period, reduced their footprint and refused to or, uh, award them additional contracts. They brought us proposals, and we didn't move forward with them. Um, I will say that the we also didn't pay on millions of dollars worth of invoices that they submitted. So while yes, they had very large contracts, they weren't paid on the invoices that were deemed suspect. Um, this is all playing out. This is going to continue to play out. There is a receiver in place. We need to continue to provide services to the families that are there. But uh, we have we took action to make sure that the the inappropriate behaviors on behalf of the CCS back office staff were dealt with. I will say um, the, the financial irregularities aside, I think it does not speak to the frontline providers that um, and the services that were delivered by CCS um, frontline staff. We actually see uh, relatively high rates of permanent housing placement um, and other metrics that we look at to, to assess provider performance. So the, um, we are addressing the CCS financial conditions and, and making sure that we are serving the families. Wow, okay. Um, I could just say that uh, if this is uh, an example of what's going on in the shelter system, and there are many other shelters that aren't so doing so great, because we're hearing more and more about them. Um, that that I'm, I question the oversight of of, of your agency. Uh, that this stuff is going on for months and months and years, and then we, we, we rating, we're rating these uh, shelters as poor, and then you continue to give them contracts, and you have them under investigation. But let me just get let me, let's just I'm going to leave that because that's still under investigation, and more will come out. Uh, as to your agency's um, response to this. But the bigger question is, you continue to um, 
deny faith-based for, for years, and nobody's held accountable for that. And all of a sudden, then you announce you're going to do faith-based, which I mentioned before. And, and Chair Levin mentioned the fact that he heard that you didn't want to do faith-based. And, and many obstacles were put up. Now we want to do them. I have, like I said, I want to schedule a tour with the commissioner. To, to, I have a lot of empty buildings. Many are in great condition. We have faith-based willing to do it. So whether you, whether you want to call them safe havens, whatever you want to call them, they're, they're going to house the homeless, and we have them available. Yet the commissioner does not answer my calls when I call. I said I want to schedule things. I want to go out. I want to go out on tour. He doesn't answer it. I call his cell phone. I don't get call back, uh, call back for, for weeks or months. And yet we still see the same thing going on. We still see the homeless out there on the streets or in the subways or suffering. So I want you to have, make a commitment that somebody will come on a tour. I don't care if it's Stephen Banks at this point, but I want to show him the buildings or her the buildings or anybody you want to come out. We are happy to assess uh, faith-based buildings yeah. for, for safe haven. Capacity. That's what I heard. They're happy, but I never get an actual commitment, period. The second thing, I just want to talk about the, um, the pet-friendly uh, locations, and I'll, I'll give it back to the chair. Um, when can we see a pet-friendly shelter? So, as I've mentioned... No, no, no. Do you have a target? Because, as you said, there's a RFP, there's, they're out there, and they've been out there for a long time, because it's not a, it's not a priority with DHS. And I know what my cat meant to me, who just passed after 19 years. I'm sorry. And I know what it meant to my family. He meant to my family. And I couldn't imagine, like Steve Levin said, he's got two cats. Um, many people have dogs and cats. We can accommodate them now in, in most of the shelters, I would say. But you're not willing. Uh, actually, I would, I would disagree with that. We are, act, we are, of course, willing to work with providers. We are looking for proposals. Nobody's are, doing it. At the end of the day, the direct on-the-ground services are provided by a not-for-profit organization. If, this in, if the organization providing services doesn't feel like they are equipped to, to handle the challenges of animals, which might be cats and dogs, but also pets can include a much broader array of different animals. Can, so can you supply you a letter that you sent to your providers who asking them to voluntarily allow some pets in your shelters. Could you show me a letter? It's in, it's in both of our RFPs. No, the RFPs are aside. That's that's a separate issue. Can you the existing shelters that are open today that are I run by my, providers? I believe my predecessor called every single one of the providers to solicit proposals for pet friendly facilities. No, no, just volunt. It's a. I'm asking a different question here. Voluntarily, without an RFP, just say, can you take? Can your place, your shelter, take? pets in, in this uh, in this condition I have a shelter director or an executive director meeting on Tuesday and we are happy to raise it at that point thank you thank you Councilmember. Um, okay just a couple of follow-up questions and then we'll let you go um, so uh, did you get any feedback uh, on the RFP explaining why uh, providers might not be interested in um, in the pets in shelter RFP um, I don't have any concrete feedback, but we can we can talk to people. But so, but nobody's. Has, I'm sorry. Has anyone replied to the RFP? When did the RFP go out? This is the rolling shelter and safe haven RFP. So they just added language out. in around pets. Yeah, and as I have mentioned, um, I have heard from some providers who are in the process of proposing on the safe havens that. I, so I do expect to see some pet friendly facilities soon. Okay. Um, it's too early to speak specifically. If there's any feedback about, um, you know, if there's it, any feedback coming that's about why uh, providers might not be um, interested, it would be helpful to know. Absolutely. Uh, okay. Um, just a little bit of clarity on the legislation. Um, so the two pre-considered intros having to do with um, eligibility. Mm -hmm. Um, I was a little unclear, so are you saying right now that an individual can access a city FEPS voucher without 
entering into shelter. Correct. Um, do they have to have a case management case open? They need to be engaged for 90 days with a caseworker, but they do not have to come into shelter. Okay. Um, and are people, do people have a caseworker on their first point of contact? That's our other bill here is saying that your first point of contact, uh, you are eligible to have a case management case. Yeah. So I want to think about this one in the context of the, the looming state budget cuts. As I've mentioned, I think expanding services when that is, is staring at us in the face, in the face is concerning. Um, and any given night, mentioned this a few times, that you have some people who are episodically homeless, about half the population, and a, another half that are long-term. Um, if, I think, given that we want to encourage the people who are really episodically homeless to, to return to their communities, to reunite with their families, to maintain those connections, um, it doesn't necessarily make sense to, to actively start case management at that initial point in contact. But I think along with the, the sightings conversation that we had, the uh, provider, an outreach provider, has the discretion to determine when somebody um, somebody needs to be on, on ha have an assigned caseworker. So if they encounter an individual and they encounter somebody in their, their first point of contact and based on um, you know, what appears to be health issues or substance use issues or something like that, the decision is made to put them on caseload right away. They have the discretion to do that. If it is somebody, you know, who appears to be more episodically homeless, they don't, they're not required to do it on that first point of contact. And frankly, I think given, given scarce resources, that is an appropriate way of, of doing it. Um, so. Since these are not really concrete, definitions. I mean, there's a gray area between episodically homeless and long-term sure. homeless because at some point somebody transitions from episodically yes. to long-term. Nobody starts out long-term. There may be indications that somebody is is has a multitude of factors that is is going to be present challenges, and that would be the case where a provider might say, this is the first time I'm seeing this individual, but I have serious concerns and I'm going to start case management right away. I'll just say, I mean, this is a proposal that we are interested in working with you on. Um, the underlying law has case management provision for individuals in shelter, and I think it's really just about striking the right balance. So we look forward okay. to continuing the conversation. Okay. Um, okay. Um, moving on to a different topic. Um, I had actually spoken to a, a street outreach team a couple months ago, and I asked them, this at the beginning of the winter, I said, what do you guys need? Uh, this was a this was a different case man, or, um, outreach team than talked about it, uh, uh, Bellevue. This street outreach team said we would love to be able to give people socks, a cup of coffee, a five dollar gift card, gloves, underwear, stuff that they need like that, um, and but then I heard that that's that. That that's, that's actually entirely like prohibited. Like they can't do that even if they wanted to do that. And is that what's the story on being able, being able to, to you know a blanket? You know somebody's shivering outside. Why can't we have street outreach teams have access to certain essentials? So our goal is really to engage people with with systems. If we have somebody who. Um, is inappropriately dressed for the weather on the on the street. I think the real issue is how do we get that person inside, um, and how do we solve the issue in the longer term rather than than dealing with the immediate um, somebody who is significantly underdressed on a very cold day. It's there's there's it is likely that the issue goes beyond the immediate. Do you have a blanket? Um, so so really. Our programs are oriented around trying to connect people to coming indoors, um, you know, on a very cold night when we're under cold blue. There's there's a significant number of places where people can shelter that that um, 
have to be open. We require that so that, that we aren't we are protecting people. Um, but the ultimate goal is to to really connect people with the longer term options. I hear you. This isn't me, Steve Levin, sitting in my lofty uh, tower at 250 Broadway saying this. This is this is street outreach workers saying we would like to be able to do this. And to their credit, uh, Bombas, which is like this very popular sock company, right? I've heard of them. They've donated like hundreds of socks to our office. Everyone in my office has Bombas in their bag uh, to give to people because socks are a really important, really, really important um, essential. And dirty socks are, uh, you know, lead to um, infection, uh, really, really uh, essential piece of, uh, of, of, of maintaining a level of sanitariness, uh, personal sanitariness. Right. So this isn't me saying this. This is I'm just I'm just actually reporting to you what a street outreach team said to me. So why not ask Understood. Bombas to donate like 10,000 socks and give them to have them boxes stockpiled at BRC and Breaking Ground and uh, and have them give them out if they want to. Interesting suggestion. We will work with our uh, philanthropy folks. Because Bombas is like the, for every every pair of socks they sell, they like donate a pair of socks. I don't know how that works from a business perspective for them, but They're good on expensive them. Expensive socks. <laughs> good on them. They're nice socks. Um, okay. Um, uh, um, Chair, can I make one point while you're you're thinking yes. about your question? Going back to the who takes Section 8 versus who takes City for HEPs, yeah. I do just want to point out for the record that refusal to take City for HEPs is a source of income discrimination. It is, absolutely, absolutely. And and we are actually, we had a rally yesterday calling for the uh, uh, Commission on Human Rights to <laughs> increase the number of attorneys that they have, or the city to increase the number of attorneys that they have at the Commission on Human Rights, because what we've, ex what we've seen in practice, and this was coming from uh, Neighbors Together, is that when somebody does uh, uh, have, comes to them saying that a landlord said that they don't take vouchers, a simple call over there, the Commission on Human Rights, and then a call from Commission on Human Rights over to the lawyer, I mean, over to the landlord, tends to rectify that situation without kind of long, longer litigation. So if we can get more staff up there to be able to do that, that would be helpful in addressing source of income. The problem with city FEPs is that there are, you, frankly, people cannot, there, there are plenty of times where people can't even get discriminated against because they can't even walk in the front door because the apartment's rent is outside of the range of a city FEPs voucher where it's not outside the range of a Section 8 voucher. We have been able, certainly there's there's a scarce supply of housing at the lower end of the rental market. We have been able to successfully move you know, well over 100,000 people out of the shelter system with. Understood. Yeah. But I have like been talking about this for several years now. I sent a letter back in November. I would love a response before next November if I can on this specific question of how many people have been placed. Um, uh, how many how many vouchers are out there that have yet to that 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 haven't been how many how many shopping letters we don't even know how many shopping letters people are walking around with and how long they've had them. Okay. I mean, you know, I'm gonna make a big stink about it, but like, this is like I sent it like right before Thanksgiving. So. Um, uh, with regard to street sweeps. Um, We have seen since 2017 an increase of 44 percent, or from 17 to 19, an increase of 44 percent in, in uh, street sweeps. Um, and that is concerning because we don't, what is happening to those people? What is their documentation as to what's going on with, with those individuals? and? Um, where is that policy coming from? And um, there's some concern that it's in response to um, some of the, the Trump administration's, um, you know, chest pounding about um, street encampments. So street sweep's not a term that we use, so I'm not. What do you use? I, I'm not 100% sure, because I'm not sure what you're referring to. 
Um, Clearances or cleaning? Um, thank you. Um, let me start by saying we are in no way, shape, or form responding to Trump administration chest thumping, to use, to use your word. Um, we work very closely if we with with colleagues at other city agencies, if we identify an accumulation of belongings that is blocking the sidewalk or otherwise um, causing problems, we notify uh, the individuals involved. We give them an opportunity to move move their things, um, and then we will sometimes do cleanings. Uh, I don't have the numbers right in front of me, um, but this is we are. This is part of larger outreach policy. It is city driven. It is not driven by the Trump administration. Okay. Um, okay. A couple more questions here. Sure. Um, with joint, with regard to the Joint Command Center, do we have data on how often NYPD is deployed through Joint Command Center? Um, I I don't have a specific stat to to speak to that. I would say that the DHS staff and NYPD staff are out every night together. Um, it, is a, it is a regular occurrence that, that teams are out. Um, they, this is the normal course of business at this point is that you have both DHS and NYPD staff in the Joint Command Center together looking at trends, looking at incoming data, and and they, those teams together are deploying resources onto the street, so it is very much a coordinated effort. Um, I'd like to go there. Can I go there? Yeah, sure. Um, the, the police commissioner just announced, like, at a breakfast or something last week about hiring, they're going to hire hundred social workers or seventy social workers or something like that. Uh, I think the nurses. Oh, the nurses. nurses, nurses yes. I'm sorry. So they ate the housing outreach unit within the police, and I will certainly defer to them for more detail. But the housing outreach unit uh, within the police department has had a couple of nurses for some time, and they are expanding that. Um, we are very pleased with that collaboration. Okay. I mean, these are what kind of nurses? These are. RNs or what, what's I'm going to defer to the police department on on exact titles. Okay, but was this a? I'm just it's. Yes, it was things? very coordinated. It, okay, it's just it's uh. I, part of the part of my frustration with this whole thing, this whole um, the JCC and the whole partnership here is, none of this was done with any. Uh, in knowledge from me, you know, I didn't, I didn't know the first thing about this. I don't know where it came from. I, we tried to get at this at the last hearing. I don't know where this came from. I don't know what the, where, what the um, defined purpose is. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, it, there's, there, this is not a, this isn't a policy that came from, uh, you know, a series of roundtables with providers and, um, and, and people that are there on the ground. Uh, this came kind of like out of some other place, and I don't know what that place is, but it's not, n it's not the normal place of kind of policy that we normally think of with stuff like this. I, I mean, I would say I think we've actively been informed by our, the outreach providers. We talk to them every day. Um, you know, I mentioned providers said we need more places to put people we and we added safe havens and permanent housing to the journey home action plan so I think we have act, we've been talking to our partners in a very collaborative kind of way um, with respect to the the PD collaboration um, you know the the NYPD has it's obviously their mission is to protect public safety and in other administrations um, the interpretation of that as it relates to homelessness has been very much about arresting people for quality of life crimes, um, I think, or perceived crimes. Um, I think what you see here is an attempt to take a different approach and to, yeah. and we really applaud that and we appreciate that I'm not, I'm not really like impugning anybody's motives here. I'm just more thinking like, okay, Steve Levin, you're the chair of the General Welfare Committee for the last six years. What do you think? Uh, Giselle Ruthier, Policy director for Coalition for the Homeless. What do you think, Judith Goldner? You know, at, at Legal Aid. What do you think? You guys have been working on this for six years, ten years. You know, like what? What? What are your thoughts on this? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. Not a single indication that like 
we had anything to say about the matter. And it's, it's just, it's, it's such a, it's strange because, you know, the NYPD doesn't know homelessness. And I like, I, you know, I, I, I ascribe only the best motivations to Chief Delatory and, um, and kind of what he's trying to do. And so I get it. Just like, you know, a little bit of collaboration goes a long way. Understood, and and we're working very closely with them on training the housing, the homeless outreach unit within police within the police department. Um, we are we are certainly looking to make this a collaborative effort, and with the individual um, uh, initiatives of Journey Home, there are active working groups with a wide variety of stakeholders on those. But why the nurses with NYPD and not with with uh, with BRC or Breaking Ground or the Street Outreach Team? Uh, I think it's it's an and, right? We are expanding the medical services that the outreach providers have on tap as well, but but it is, so it's, you see it on both sides. Okay, but they're not going to be, you know, who do they, who are they, where's the chain of command? Are they, is there, are there I didn't know that their NYPD had nurses. So um, I don't know what the chain of command is. Who do they re who do they report to? They report to the head of the homeless outreach unit within the PD. But again, I would prefer yeah. to defer sure, specific. I'll have to ask, yeah, I'll have to ask them. Uh, like, what are they and what are they supposed to do? Like so, they go, they will go out with um, with outreach teams. Um, including with DHS staff. They will accompany uh, contracted outreach providers as well, um, and they can make medical assessments. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, in those situations of crisis when they're there, um, because it's a police effort, that is a place where if somebody needs to be assessed, um, taken in for a medical assessment, they, they are in a position to do that. Okay. So is that... I mean to facilitate Kendra's law? Is that what you're saying? No. Um, if an individual is is in a point where they might be a danger to themselves or others, and we want to get Kendra's law, right? Uh, Kendra's law is sort of an ongoing uh, medication management, and I'm I'm gonna leave it at that level of detail because I am not the expert in that. But um, if some the what I'm talking about is the requirement or the, the provision under the state mental health law where an individual who is, is at a particular moment a medical professional in conjunction with the police department can, can take that person to a hospital for a point of assessment. That person might end up being admitted. They might end up not being admitted based on the, the clinical judgment of the medical professionals. But the outreach teams were able to do that before. That's what they told me when they said we sent people over to Bellevue. They get assessed and they go right back out. There's a, there's a, in the outreach teams can't require somebody to go if they don't aren't comfortable going. Um, but an NYPD the PD nurse can say can, you're going. Right. Which, if at a moment where where somebody is at a real crisis point, that is sometimes the right thing to do. It's not a decision we take lightly. Yeah, I'm not thrilled with that. Um, Okay, I know you have to leave. There's one last question here um, having to do with, um, sorry, bear with me here. Um, sorry, just one last question about the, the, the 90 days caseload city FEPS rule. So when, the, it's because that, that, as it stands now, that, that 90 days, Starts. I don't know where that 90 days clock starts because the caseload question, case management services, there's not a defined time when somebody receives that. That's, I think, why we're looking at first point of contact. Honestly, anybody that's on the street should, like, have, if they want, case management. I mean, I guess maybe you could put it that way and say, if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. If you're, like look, I'm only going to be homeless for the next, like, two weeks, don't bother, or I'm transient. I'm going to be sleeping on a couch, you'll never see me again, don't bother. But if somebody's like, yeah, like, I want to get in to some case management, like, they shouldn't, why should they have to, and, and to reach a kind of an, a, a gauzy, undefined, wow, you know, you're, now you're long-term, you, you know, when is long-term, and or when is it, and it's, it's, there's a lot of discretion there within the, so an, no appeal. An outreach provider places somebody 
uh, assigns a caseworker to an individual. 90 days later, they are eligible for city right. FAPS. That aligns with the eligibility that exists within shelter. And right, no, I, I'm, I'm more talking about that, the starting point, the, the when somebody receives that case management, that actually is, now that I'm thinking about it, that is actually the, because that starts the clock. And whether that clock is 30 days or 90 days, that's the other bill. But the bill about when does that clock start and who starts it, and whether they're required to start it or how much discretion they have, that's a, that's a big, that's a lot of latitude as it seems right now. So as, as Aaron mentioned, we'd be, yeah. we're okay. happy to work with you on Got this Got it, one. okay. With that, I thank you very much thank for your you. time. And look forward to seeing you guys next month for the budget hearing. Thank you to the members of the public for your patience. Uh, first panel will call up uh, Kareem Walker is here, Josh Dean from Human.NYC, Craig Hughes, Urban Justice Center, and Danielle Emery from URI. Craig, you get to go twice because. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't need that. No, 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 please, no, it's okay, because you're because you're delivering testimony on behalf of, of somebody else as well. Um, so we're gonna have three minutes for testimony because we do have a number of people that have signed up. So uh, you can speed read. You can also submit to uh, for the record and and give testimony that might not necessarily be verbatim. Feel free to feel free to condense and 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 submit the rest into the record. Just make sure the red light is on your microphone. I think it's on, okay. Okay, all right. Um, okay, <laughs> good afternoon. My name is Danielle Emery. I'm the director of the People and Animals Living Safely program at the Urban Resource Institute. I would like to thank the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to testify today in support of Bills 1483 and 1484, and also Chair Levin for his leadership in taking bold initiative on the issue of pets in New York City's shelter systems. URI is the only DV shelter provider in New York City and one of less than 3% nationwide that offers victims of domestic violence access to shelter with their pets in a co-living environment. Since 2013, URI has welcomed 214 families and close to 300 pets into the PALS program. Today we have 53 families and 71 pets in seven different shelter locations. I share these numbers to illustrate that co-sheltering can happen and is already happening in New York City and offer our experience in the hope that those present will see URI as an example and resource for how to implement these services. We often receive referrals from individuals and families who are not eligible for the PALS program for a variety of reasons. Many of these people will end up at PATH or a single assessment center. As the Comptroller's, Comptroller's Report Housing Survivors published in October 2019 showed, more than 40% of families currently in DHS family shelter shelters are there as a result of domestic violence. With only approximately 2,500 beds in HRA's DV shelter system, it is a reality of New York City that many individuals and families who become homeless as a result of domestic violence will seek assistance from DHS. Any measure taken to address homelessness in New York City must take into account the role domestic violence has in its occurrence and the two shelter systems seen as complementary and not disparate entities. It is crucially important that New York City, its government agencies, and countless not-for-profit providers continue to develop innovative services to reduce barrier, barriers to shelter for our city's most vulnerable populations. For the pet owners within these populations, that means policies and services that not only accommodate, but welcome and value the companion animals in people's lives, recognizing the deep attachment and bonds present in their relationships. Bills 1483 and 1484 will help to illuminate the scope of need for services and begin the process of formalizing a coordinated citywide response. This response needs to be a joint effort between both human services and animal welfare agencies. 
It will not be successful unless we work together to develop and implement the response. URI hopes and stands ready to be seen as a resource and a model for how these efforts can take shape in New York City as our community continues to expand our work in assisting pet owning families in crisis. Thank you. Good afternoon, Councilman Levin. The red light has to be on. Yeah, you got it. Right. Good afternoon, Councilman Levin, ladies and gentlemen of the council, and distinguished guests. My name is Karim Walker, and for the past seven months, I myself have been homeless, street homeless, though through the help of the New York City Council, New York Common Pantry, I now have a 2010 e that has now been approved by the city, and I believe that, oh, excuse me, <laughs> that over these past seven months, I've been, spend, I've been spending the time on the subways instead of a shelter because I don't feel that the subway, that I feel like the subway system is a much safer alternative over the shelters. Um, journey home, as the Deputy Commissioner has mentioned, it, while a laudable position and a laudable uh, a program, doesn't really take into account the root causes of homelessness. And I believe that the, oh, hold up, excuse me. Um, you got it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Is I believe it's a haphazard plan that street homelessness, is, especially for those who don't know about how the program works or how the program is supposed to, uh, how the program can get you off the streets. And in addition to that, the voucher systems as well. Can couple that with the voucher system, makes that even uh, an even bigger barrier for some who have experienced long-term street homelessness. To overcome. As a homeless person, I believe the city's proposal to increase the value of the vouchers is a is a great first step, as, especially considering the fact that we spend approximately thirty six hundred dollars a month to house homeless New Yorkers in in the shelter system. While this vote, while up, while we can also, while, which is roughly double the uh, the market value of an apartment in Manhattan, if we. If, we are willing to, if we are willing to put into the, commit to the budget warehousing homeless folks, why are we not willing to put that same commitment into giving them affordable housing? Uh, thank you for your time, and I will gladly accept any questions. Thank you. Um, okay. <clears throat> Hi, uh, my name is Craig Hughes, but I'm going to be uh, reading testimony of um, Peter Malvin, who couldn't be here today. Uh, so um, I'm going to read it verbatim uh, with all that comes with um, in terms of him referencing himself and not me. But okay. So uh, good afternoon. My name is Peter Malvin. I am a safety net activist, the co-chair of the Consumer Committee of the Continuum of Care, and the vice president of the Midnight Run. I'm here today to provide my feedback to LS 9863 and LS 9872, which uh, editorially I believe is now intro 1902 and 1903. Uh, having participated in outreach as a case manager and having also been a consumer of services, I'm aware of how long it may take to get case management services through uh, being assigned to a caseload. This past year, I worked with Human NYC to co-author a white paper on the, quote, sightings process, which includes recommendations on how to make outreach case management services more accessible to those of us living on the streets. Human.NYC has entered the white paper into the record, and I recommend you read it. Uh, I would also recommend it. Uh, this brings me uh, to the uh, to LS intro uh, LS 9872, which I believe is 1903, uh, which would cut the 90 days on caseload requirement down to 30 in order for unsheltered New Yorkers to be eligible for any rental assistance going through New York City contacts. Based on interviews and findings in the aforementioned white paper, I suggest additional criteria of obtaining eligibility for New York City rental assistance be 60 days post initial, quote, sighting, and documentation that a person is living on the street or place not meant for human habitation. Additionally, to make further progress in dealing with street homelessness, I believe that any sightings of known or recognized persons asleep or awake should be counted as a sighting, and that there should be a uniform number of sightings and case management of, uh, eligibility across all outreach teams. I'd also like to recommend that there be flexibility in the times when people are engaged. People should be engaged at times that they, uh, that they're, I'm sorry, at times for people, uh, at times best for people who are street homeless. 
uh, not at the times that are best for the outreach workers, such as very early in the morning. Uh, there should also be transparency on available housing options, in addition to ins uh, ensuring that case managers utilize best practices, such as the SOAR program, which is an intensive uh, linkage of people to Social Security benefits, uh, which they are likely eligible. Um, and I can't take any questions for Peter, but I think he spoke for himself very well. So, thanks. And then do you have testimony you want to deliver on behalf of Craig Hughes? Yeah, but I think Josh has one from a, someone who's experiencing homelessness that's more important. So I, I'm happy to switch out. Is that okay? Yeah, no problem. Okay. You could just identify yourself for the record. Sure. Uh, my name is Josh Dean. I'm reading on behalf of Charmaine Hamid. Hi, Charmaine. Good afternoon. My name is Charmaine Hamid. I've been homeless in New York City for much of the last 15 years. A few months ago, I was placed into an SRO. Before then, I lived on the streets rather than the shelters. I was more comfortable living on the streets because the city shelters, particularly the intake shelters, felt less safe than the streets. Working with outreach team was difficult. I lived near Penn Station and I felt like I would meet countless different outreach teams. BRC is downstairs in the station and breaking ground, which used to be common ground, is more likely to check on me when I'm outside. Head a few blocks up and you'll meet Urban Pathways at Port Authority. Then there's Homestat, but I'm not really sure what they do. Also, the homeless outreach unit of the NYPD comes by all the time. They just ask us for our name of date of birth and that's really it. One of the more frustrating things about living on the streets is that I've had to answer the same question so many times. How long have I been homeless? Do I drink? Do I have any history of domestic violence? Every time there is a new outreach team, I have to answer those questions again. Every time my case manager leaves and I get a new case manager, I have to answer those questions again. It's so frustrating. Another frustrating part of living on the streets is the sightings process because it's so confusing. Breaking ground, their thing was, we need to see you eight times in that same location. Where you sleep at, where you go to the bathroom at, where you eat at, that's where you have to be whenever they come around. No particular timing or nothing, which is almost impossible for a homeless person to do on the streets of New York. You have to move around at some point. You cannot just sit there for 24 hours in one spot, hoping that an outreach team is going to come look for you to give you some information or get you some information. And you're never going to be placed in an appropriate manner, quickly and in a place you feel safe, if you're not seen that eight times and logged in by that particular agency. As a co-author in Human.NYC's new white paper on the sightings process, I hope that the recommendations will be taken seriously. People who want a case manager should be able to get a case manager. Trust me, no one is out there pretending to be homeless. If you're homeless and asking about services, there should not be a holdup. Also, we really need the outreach teams to be giving out consistent information. BRC should have the same number of sightings as breaking ground. Otherwise, you leave us frustrated, confused, and talking amongst ourselves to try to figure out what is going on. Thank you for your time. I don't have a phone, so please contact Josh Dean, me, if you would like to learn more about my story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I want to thank you all for your testimony. Um, uh, I appreciate very much the um, advocacy that you're doing, all three of you. Um, um, with, with your eye, I just want to uh, um, acknowledge that um, and now, have you been contacted by uh, DHS to see how, how it, it works in that immensely complex system that, that you work in? Um, a sarcasm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in the longer form of my statement, I talk a little bit more about URI's work. And we do actually have shelters for homeless families um, where we would potentially be interested in having our program with pets. Um, I think the, the RFP that gets talked about a lot is for a very specific time type of homeless shelter, as I understand it. Um, low barrier, uh, I think, single person shelter. It's not a family not shelter. A family Okay. As I understand, I could be um, incorrect on that, but that is my understanding. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. Yeah, that that's good. That didn't that didn't come through in the testimony of the uh, deputy commissioner. So, um, because one would think that DHS could just talk to HRA because they're in the same office. They are like the same mm -hmm. agency, basically. <laughs> that they could find out what HRA is doing that is so successful with URI. So. And especially uh, given like that the model of the family shelter and a lot of it is the same like they're in their own apartments they yep. there is the ability for pets to be there yep 
Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and yes, I, so I thank you very much for, for, for doing that and for being so dedicated to it because yes, it is very important, especially and for children yes. and people suffering trauma. And additionally, because of the housing shortage and because of the difficulty with vouchers, many of our families are not able to identify permanent housing by the time their time in emergency shelter is elapsed. So then they get transitioned into DHS shelters yes. where we struggle immensely at getting their reasonable accommodations <clears throat> to continue on with their pets um, accepted exactly. and processed. So. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes I've, I've seen that happen. Um, Three times this week. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, I bet. No, no, like in, my team has been helping three clients this week that we have been trying to get to have their pets be able to be with them. It increases the urgency to, um, to have direct to permanent housing out of, mm -hmm. out of your system and not, and not yes. have to go through DHS. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, and then, uh, Just as a, uh, Josh, you, in, in your testimony, in, um, the testimony of Charmaine, and then in your um, white paper, um, do you want to maybe speak to just what the recommendations are in terms of, of streamlining or rationalizing or whatever it is, um, making rational, not like rationalized, but like making rational the, um, the sightings process? Sure. So first things first, we're not saying that, you know, the first time someone's seen on the street, automatically every single person should get a case manager. But if someone's out on the streets, it's clear that they're homeless and they're asking about services, they're asking for a case manager, they should get a case manager that, that first time. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, we're recommending that the number of sightings be standardized across the outreach teams mm -hmm. because what we're seeing, um, we asked uh, 41 people um, if they were from familiar with the sightings process, 78% of the people said yes. And then we asked, okay, well, how many times do you think you need to be seen? And from there, we saw the answers range pretty wildly. So it ranged from two to 12. The most common answer was six. Some people said, I don't know how many times, but I know it's a few times. One person said every day for a year. So there was a really, really wide range of, of understandings. If the outreach teams all had the same understanding, follow the same process, and at the very least, had a consistent message that they communicated to people on the streets, there wouldn't be so much misinformation, so much confusion, so much frustration, um, and hopefully we'd be able to move people through the process quicker. Um, and I just want to say that, uh, just for the record, so last May, I believe, uh, I had a meeting with you and DSS, or uh, DHS, and um, your suggestion was to not adhere to this chronicity requirement for people to get into safe haven, at which time they said, no, that doesn't, we're not going to do that. And, um, and here we are in 2020, and they are, in fact, I guess, announcing that they are taking that suggestion. So congratulations. I, I hope they uh, follow through with that, but thank you. Right. I'm assuming you didn't, I get notified when they were making it. I got notified when you got notified. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, yes, I think you know for all of your, your all everyone's testimony here. It's incredibly um, important that uh, that you all keep testifying and keep on making putting this out there in the public sphere because um, it's how policy gets changed. It might not happen you know the next day, but uh, in, it is in fact the um, uh, the only way that it gets done. So I want to thank you very much for your for your testimony and for staying engaged with us, and I greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. Okay. okay. We'll also uh, call up now. Um, Hallie Chu from uh, the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer's office. Isabel Adams from the Brooklyn Borough President, Eric Adams. And Susan Stetzer from Manhattan Community Board 3. Oh, and we're joined by Councilmember Vanessa Gibson.
Just make sure that the light is on and identify mm -hmm. yourself for the record. Hi, uh, my name is Hallie Chu. I'm with the Manhattan Borough President's Office, and I'm reading testimony on behalf of Gail. I submitted a much longer version of the testimony, but just wanted to jump right into um, a set of recommendations. I'm specifically targeting um, the Borough President's work with um, the Emergency Shelter Network, and then also with DHS's Street Homeless Solution Unit on um, the Respite Bets program with houses of worship throughout New York City. Um, Manhattan currently is one of the sites that has the most um, religious facility sites, offering the most number of beds um, out of the program, about half of all the boroughs. Um, so just want to jump right in. Um, according to one of the DHS's um, kind of quarterly, monthly report, um, the average daily utilization rate of respite beds is within a range of 74 to 86 percent over the past four quarters in Manhattan. The data from the two Manhattan-centric drop-in centers show an average daily utilization rate as low as 61 percent for one month and as high as 92 percent for another month. While the ride, wide ranges reflect the transitory nature of street homelessness and fluctuations are to be expected, I believe addressing the following issues will increase the utilization rate of respite beds and allow for expansion of the respite shelter model into more houses of worship throughout the city. Curfew requirements. Individuals placed into respite sites are required to report to the site by a certain time, sometimes via designated transportation from the drop-in center to the site. They must remain on site until a specified time the next morning, also required to be transported back to a drop-in center at some locations. Curfew is very limiting to people who work or have other obligations that prevent them from getting into a respite site on time. Um, DHS should work with the shelters on more flexible curfew requirements so working individuals who need shelter can access respite beds. Um, uh, recommendation on pets. Um, in light of intros 1483 and 1484, um, for compensations around that to see if that can be accommodated at the site. Um, Drop-in center accommodations. Multiple constituents have raised um, issues about drop-in centers not having um, anything other than chairs to sleep in, um, and then also constituents feeling unsafe, especially women who access these drop-in centers. Um, coordination with sites. Most res respite shelter sites are run by volunteers. Understandably, volunteer availability impacts the overall availability of respite beds. For example, fewer sites are open during the summer months because congregation members may be out of town. Um, yet both DHS and advocates from organizations like the Emergency Shelter Network recognize that having a consistent number of available beds is beneficial to program coordination and placement. One idea that the ESN supports is for nearby shelter sites to collaborate and keep more beds open through sharing volunteers. Um, and then one other recommendation um, for resources and is to be able to have resources to bring on a full-time coordinator to encourage collaboration among existing respite sites and also with agencies, with drop-in centers, and obviously the funding to be able to support um, people in these coordination roles to improve and perhaps expand the program. Um, and there are other recommendations with the rest of the testimony. Thank you. Just one thing to follow up on that. Um, it's not impossible for a respite program to have a, a paid staff member through right. um, through one of the outreach mm -hmm. organizations. Mm -hmm. um, and it's relatively, um, you know, cost effective. It's not uh, incredibly expensive mm -hmm. to, to have one or two paid staff members. Um, um, yeah. This happens in my district. Mm -hmm. so, um, I'm some, and it's, familiar with those it. are the obviously the better run sites, so mm -hmm. the sites that are willing and lack resources, I think, would benefit yeah. from having Yes, there's a, there's, you know, in this day and age with Slack groups and mm -hmm. whatever, you know, you can yeah. Yeah. probably pretty, pretty easily build a consortium of volunteers mm -hmm. to be able to cover different mm -hmm. churches and synagogues within a network. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so thank you very thank much you. for your <laughs> Hello, um, my name is Isabel Adams, and I am here to testify on behalf of Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. Um, good morning, Chair Levin and committee members. Thank you for the opportunity today to speak on measures that would improve the circumstances for people experiencing homelessness with pets in New York City. Borough President Adams supports intros 1483 and 1484, which would provide accommodations for pets in homeless shelters as well as require reporting on pet placement. 
The borough president has been a proponent of initiatives to combat street homelessness, as well as efforts to make it easier for people and pets to be together. Last year, he urged the passage of Bill S-4919, advanced by State Senator Parker, which offers a $100 tax credit to people when they adopt a pet from a shelter. That gets to the heart of helping homeless animals, but we must look at this issue holistically. Recently, the National Alliance to End Homelessness published a manual on keeping people and pets together in homeless services. It outlines existing models of sheltering people and pets together across the country, some of which are simple and do not require capital improvements. We need not start from scratch, so let's not overcomplicate the matter with conversations about building new pet-friendly buildings or complete retrofits. We can make select existing shelters accessible to people with pets. New York City should be an example of how compassion and common sense can work hand in hand. Research indicates pet ownership within the homeless population can decrease stress and anxiety, provide a sense of responsibility, decrease feelings of loneliness, and create more opportunities for social interactions with other people. If we are to best serve our community, our laws need to prevent the rupture of these beneficial human-animal bonds. People experiencing homelessness endure enough trauma. Why further traumatize them by forcing them to give up their pets, possibly the only stable relationship they have in their lives? Borough President Adams urges you to swiftly pass these measures to absolve our city's most vulnerable from the burden of having to decide between seeking services and giving up their animal companions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Craig Hughes. I'm a supervising social worker with the Urban Justice Center Safety Net Project. Uh, we have a much longer testimony uh, for the record, but I'm going to just speak more plainly uh, for the purposes of this. Um, it's regrettable that Councilmember Holden chose not to stay. Um, I think there would be a great discussion uh, with the community if he was interested in hearing. Um, just, just to clarify, I think he is actually having a meeting with DHS. <laughs> For what it's worth. Yeah. Hope it's more productive. So, um, uh, so. As someone who's uh, worked in homeless services for well over a decade, um, for, as some, and someone who's done outreach, um, one way I've come to think about outreach models is there's a contact and policing model, and then there's a harm reduction model. And there's an inherent cruelty to saying that we want to uh, that we encounter someone who's very cold on the street, and then we say we're worried about the long term and not the short term. Uh, a basic rule of social work practice. Um, probably some other professions is you meet someone where you at. When I was trained in harm reduction work many years ago, uh, what that actually meant is you physically meet someone where they're at. Uh, and if they are freezing, you give them a blanket because that will reduce the harm that comes from being frozen. Um, and the same with that is that if someone is saying, I'm not safe in a shelter, but for example, I'll, I'm staying on the street tonight, but I need hand warmers, you give them hand warmers. This is really basic practice. Um, so it was, it was guised in bureaucratic speak of the worrying about the long term, but really if you're not worried about the short term, you're not worried about someone. Um, and so what I would say is that we, uh, we have seen in the, under the de Blasio administration, guys under progressive rhetoric, an increasing number of uh, police encroachments into the outreach system, uh, each responding uh, to a, a moment of panic pressed by the press. Um, so each uh, going back to uh, uh, going back to the um, Joint Command Center, we're using militarized rhetoric to talk about people who literally have nothing. Uh, to spend millions of dollars on a center to watch 20,000 camera views, staffed by uh, police and outreach workers to disperse uh, to re reportedly disperse services that are uh, probably almost always accompanied by police. Uh, so first and foremost, I would put forward once you uh, expand something like a uh, Joint Command Center and a criminal justice reform like this, it's almost impossible to get it retracted. So I just want to be clear: our position is that it should be ended and closed right now before it becomes normalized. That kind of Orwellian absurdity should not exist in this city. It is not helpful for homeless people. It is helpful for bureaucrats trying to manage bad press coverage. Um, I will also go on to say, just in reference to uh, intro 1902 uh, with the case management, uh, we had hoped to get this uh, to convince uh, Council Member Levin uh, to put this in the bill. Hopefully you will. Um, a mandate that outreach teams uh, actually carry basic supplies with them, including petty cash. And I'm going to go a little bit over my time with one very brief example that I think is powerful. I apologize. Um, we had a, a client come in uh, not too long ago, an uh, elderly woman uh, living uh, in public space for well over a year, a woman over 70 years old. Um, she was engaged repeatedly by a municipal outreach team. Uh, she had a uh, breaking point uh, in that uh, trust building process where she had had her sneakers stolen. And when her sneakers were stolen and the outreach worker showed up the next day, uh, she said to them, can you please help me get new sneakers? Uh, 
Uh, it was cold. She needed sneakers. And the outreach team, and I am dead serious about this, said, um, it's good to see you. I'm sorry, we cannot, like, we can't do that and walked away. Uh, she then took a subway in hospitals, uh, hospital uh, socks into Manhattan uh, and walked uh, to get the cheapest pair of sneakers she could find. I believe that municipal outreach worker wanted to help her. I also believe the kind of bureaucratic nonsense that came out today about worrying about the long term harmed her. And it also meant that she did not build a relationship with that outreach team. In fact, it got to the point where she refused to let them place her in a safe haven when she was willing to be placed in a safe haven because she was so hurt and offended by what had happened. And I think in this bill, desperately needs to include a mandate that outreach teams provide harm reduction services, which for me not doesn't just mean needle exchange. I know that brings all this other stuff that people are concerned about, wrongly, but whatever. Uh, it means blankets, it means warming gloves, it means socks, and it means some petty cash when someone's in a desperate situation and needs a pair of sneakers. That's how you build trust and that's how you get someone inside. It's not just about the availability of safe havens, which we all know aren't coming by the hundreds tomorrow. It's about getting someone through the night and building trust so that when that safe haven is there, they're open to it. Thanks. Thanks, Craig. Thank you. Um, I'm Susan Stetzer, District Manager of Manhattan Community Board 3, which is the East Village, Lower East Side, and Chinatown. We have many street homeless, especially in the East Village and in three of our parks. Um, we have over 15 shelters. We work very closely with Goddard Riverside, our Manhattan Outreach Consortium group. And I want to say that their outreach, outreach workers, I think, are absolutely the best. They're very caring people, and they will put people on case management um, at a first sighting if they want to be on case management. Um, they use that discretion. Um, Community Board 3 has been advocating for shelter for people with pets for years, and we're very happy to see there's finally progress. Uh, currently, pets are have been registered as emotional support animals and accepted into safe havens with owners. Mock will take the responsibility for this process, including fees. Uh, Lower East Side Harm Reduction also does this, but there must be much more awareness that this can be done, and I'm sure more organizations would do it if they understood the need. Um, we clearly need more beds available for people with pets as well as drop-in centers. Right now, there's half a block from my office. I have a couple with a dog living under scaffolding for months. Um, they're an example of street homelessness, street homeless people with barrier for sh uh, to shelter. They've been refused um, as a couple by family intake, and they're now trying to get their dog um, registered as a support animal. Um, I would like to also take this opportunity to speak about other barriers to shelter. Um, big one is safety, which is talked about. Um, a lot today and drugs are part of that safety issue and we see many single adult men that will not enter the shelter or they do leave the shelter because they feel unsafe. Um, we recently had a shelter resident a uh, block away from us uh, rested with 200 bags of heroin. It's not safe for other residents when you have these kind of drugs in the shelter. Uh, we have lobbied very unsuccessfully for DHS peacekeepers to increase safety, but DHS will only assign them to mental health and DHS-run facilities, um, and this is a money issue. Um, and we have been uh, also advocating for a formal protocol of outreach workers with harm reduction workers. Um, our outreach workers have informally tried this on its own. It seems to be successful, and I don't understand why there isn't a more formal uh, city policy uh, for this. Um, we need more, there are not enough safe havens. We do have people on waiting lists for safe havens because they do not want to leave their community. There's beds available in the Bronx, but not lower Manhattan. Um, we have only two safe havens in Community Board 3. Definitely need more in lower Manhattan. Um, I also just want to mention a few other things. I know, um, I hope this new program with the hub, the command center, I hope it becomes workable. Right now, people are not necessarily coordinated. I have um, interfered in a cleanup where the uh, people involved were on case management, but the Homestead people there didn't know, and I said, don't you have access uh, to the hub? They said, no, our superiors do. 
And I also, the uh, police homeless outreach, were telling them to move. And I said, how can you tell them to move when it's against the law? And so they didn't tell them to move. But if I hadn't been standing there, um, they would have been moved. And then how would their case manager find them? These are all incredibly important perspectives. Um, and, and it's immensely frustrating. It's not just about you know whether I was consulted around this policy, but whether you all were consulted about this policy, um, and um, and whether street outreach teams were consulted about this, this policy. So you know, there's there's a lot more work that we need to do, and I think it really does start with um, actually engaging with um, people that have uh, lived experience and. Um, and people with on-the-ground expertise. And so we appreciate very much your patience in, in, um, in, in waiting to testify, but really appreciate your testimony, and we'll um, uh, use it as a, um, a guide moving forward for sure. So greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. We have um, Michelle uh, Hila Gomez from ASPCA, Marika Azoff from ASPCA, Thank you. Harold Moss from Ca uh, Catholic, Char Catholic Charities, is that right? Yeah. And Kathy Dazari from Voters for Animal Rights and Behavioral Consultant. Okay, whoever wants to begin. Um, good afternoon. My name is Michelle Villagomez. I'm the legislative uh, senior director for the ASPCA, and we're here to discuss and share our support of intro 1483 and 1484. Um, these bills are critical to understanding the scope of the problem created by a lack of pet-friendly sheltering options and would push the city to come up with a practical plan to help homeless pet owners. It's important to consider that homeless pet owners may constitute a hidden population. Some are secretive for fear of their pets being confiscated, and because pets, especially dogs, are not allowed in most shelters, homeless pet owners may not appear on counts. Uh, the ASPCA believes that keeping people and pets together whenever it is possible and appropriate to do so should be a priority for the animal welfare community and for society as a whole. To achieve this goal, we must put aside preconceived notions and treat people with respect and dignity, whatever their financial or other life circumstances. We must support laws and policies that strengthen and support rather than break the bond between people and animal companions. We have seen that co-sheltering, a housing approach that keeps pets and people together, works. Here in New York City, we can point to the successful PALS, People and Animals Living Safely program created by the Urban Resource Institute. URI discovered that nearly half of its clients were staying in abusive relationships to prevent harm to their pets. URI now has animal-friendly accommodations at six facilities, and they've allowed more than 100 families to escape domestic violence. They serve as a model here. 
A study performed by the NYU Silver School of Social Work done in 2018 found four themes regarding barriers to obtaining housing and accessing services. Um, one of them is pet exclusion policies. The prohibition of animals in city shelters, drop-in centers, and transitional housing programs is a major barrier for those who would accept placement if not for their pets. City shelters accept service and emotional support animals, but homeless people with pets still face the agonizing choice to give them away or remain on the streets together. Surveys of homeless pet owners reveal a level of attachment to their pets that may be greater than reported by pet owners who live in traditional residences. Um, Leslie Irvine conducted a study of 72 homeless pet owners in California, Colorado, and Florida, and she points out that keeping a pet while homeless involves an intense level of commitment and a little more than, than hardship. Her study shows that the homeless routinely give up offers of sheltering that would require them to give up or separate from their pets. Numerous private organizations provide essential services for, home, for the homeless with companion animals. Um, through our own pet retention and community medicine work in New York and LA, we're learning how effective collaboration between um, animal welfare, law enforcement, and human services can be in helping cats, keeping pets and people together. Um, I have a colleague here who's going to speak to our programs. Um, but we have to keep in mind that the nonprofit partners cannot really um, solve this problem. You know, we can work to help people keep their pets in harm reduction, provide services to folks on the street with their animals, but unless there is a place that we can direct them to for proper housing, we are um, left at a disadvantage. So we look forward to working with you. We support 1483, 1484, and we would like the city to consider us a resource in having these conversations as how to provide these services at shelters. Hi, my name is Marika Azoff, and today I'm speaking on the behalf of the ASPCA's Community Engagement Program, a program that works to keep people and pets together. We provide access to services that improve the health and welfare of animal, animals whose caregivers are facing challenges or hardships. We provide spay-neuter services, access to veterinary care, behavioral assessments, supply support, educational resources, and case management. Our program supports people experiencing homelessness in a myriad of ways, but I will focus on two categories today. Pet owners who reach out to us for support and pet owners who are referred to our program by the community. On average, our program receives three phone calls a week from people who are either at risk of becoming homeless or who are already experiencing homelessness. The majority of these callers are seeking temporary or long-term boarding for their pets while they enter the shelter system. Some of these pet owners are in the process of getting ESA or emotional support animal letters so that their pets will have a better chance of going into the shelters with them. This is a process that's complex and can take a long time. Some pet owners are in the process of being evicted and reach out because they want to avoid having to surrender their pets. And many of these pet owners are living on the streets because they would rather do so than be separated from their pets. While the ASPCA can provide supplies and veterinary care for these pets and pet owners, we do not have the resources nor the capacity to temporarily board or house people's pets. Instead, we encourage people to identify a friend or family member who is willing to house the pet or pets, and we provide them with any needed supplies, transportation, and veterinary care. While we aim to keep people and pets together, we do also offer surrender support when needed. However, often people don't have a family or friend, a family member or friend who is able to care for their pets and may be forced to either give up their pets or stay out of the shelter system. We also receive for referrals from the community for people experiencing homelessness with pets. We send caseworkers to the location to offer our services to the pet owners. While it's certainly not ideal for humans or pets to live on the street, I am continuously impressed by the condition that the, most of the pets living on the streets are in. Most of the time, the pet owner or pet owners have spayed or neutered their pets, kept them up to date on vaccines, and have a veterinarian that works with them and their pets. Pets are family, and for the pet owners experiencing homelessness that I've worked with, having their family with them is what keeps them going every day. I worked with a man in December of 2019 who I visited after receiving a complaint of a quote-unquote panholder, panhandler, using his cat to make money. This man's cat was spayed up to date on vaccines and he had an entire suitcase full of clothes to keep her warm in the winter. She had a harness, a leash, and was showing absolutely no signs of fear or stress. He had all of her paperwork and so much food that he didn't even accept the food I had brought for him because it would be too heavy to carry. I asked if he needed any support and he said, I just want people to stop harassing me and my cat and to find a place where we can live in peace. 
Our program can provide a lot of support for community members experiencing or at risk of experiencing homelessness, but we can't solve the problem. As Michelle said, we need reasonable pet and housing policies in place that help keep people and pets together. I am consistently inspired by the strength of the love that pet owners have for their pets, even in the face of immense hardships. I hope that moving forward, these individuals and families can receive more support in staying with their beloved pets, and I urge you to support intros 1483 and 1484. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Levin. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Kathy Nazari. I am a board member of Voters for Animal Rights, and I work with animals and their humans on behavioral issues. As such, I fully support intros 1483 and 1484. These bills are important for their, their recognition of animal companions as integral family members. The physical and mental health benefits of living with animals for both human and animals have been well documented, and I've provided a few references for you. Um, we have a caregiver attachment, an emotional bond that is stronger and more secure than we have with most other humans. This often gives people a sense of purpose that another living being depends on them. The symbiotic relationship releases chemicals in our and in our pets' brains that are responsible for happiness, intimacy, and relaxation, among other things. Our pets sense our moods and give us comfort and emotional support and not just those who are deemed as emotional support animals. As a professional, sadly, I see what happens when that human-animal bond is broken. We've all seen videos of how cows grieve when their young are taken from them. It's heartbreaking. Our cats, dogs, birds, and other companion animals perceive us as their parents. Any of us who has ever lost a parent knows that indescribable and profound devastation. It causes depression, anxiety, loneliness that can manifest in physical symptoms for both the animal and the human. It can trigger such extreme forms of separation anxiety where some animals will refuse to eat or drink and sometimes self-injure. Companion animals have been paired with veterans suffering PTSD. In 100% of those cases, the traumatic symptoms were reduced. Our homeless population has experienced and continued to experience multiple traumatic events. They basically live in a state of depression and isolation. We know from empirical evidence that having an animal companion creates a sense of connectedness and comfort. By forcing them to endure another extreme stress of giving up their beloved family member, we are destroying so much when we tear this fa nuclear family apart. Our New York City shelters and rescue groups are overloaded with homeless animals. If pets already have a family, they should be allowed to stay with them and not overburden our animal shelters that need room for truly homeless animals. This legislation tells DHS to create a common sense plan to allow people with pets to enter and live in homeless shelters and not force any painful separations. Let's truly be a progressive and compassionate city that helps two- and four-legged families stay together, and let's help our hardworking and overburdened animal shelters and their workers by reducing intake of pets who already have a home. For these reasons, I urge the passing of intros 1483 and 1484, and I thank you for your time. And I just wanted to add quickly, if you want me to email you these references, I can do that so you can just click on the links. No, thank you, thank you. And just to follow up on one point that you made, um, and I'm not sure if there's any any scientific studies to, to back this up, but um, the experience of living on the street for an extended period of time um, is very is it's very stressful on somebody's um, psych psychologically and psych uh, physiologically, um, and um, and that that stress. Uh, can manifest in in ways like PTSD, and so the the yes. um, you know the proven 100 um, percent correlation between veterans um, uh, symptoms being am ameliorated by a PTSD being ameliorated by an animal, and um, the correlation with just living on the street, which is its own inducer of, of PTSD, I think is probably. Um, Probably pretty. It would stand to reason. I don't know if there's been any. Um, 
Actually, I do have some information about that. The National Alliance to End Homelessness has actually determined that the experience of being on the street does cause PTSD. Yeah. And um, in many cases, when someone has an animal who they are living on the street with, it does um, help to reduce some of that, um, some of the trauma and some of the anxiety and depression that's associated with PTSD. It's constant fight, fight or flight. Exactly, yes. Um, Thank you so much. Thank you. I, I would just like to add one other thing, is that there have been studies also that show that even just looking at an animal or stroking an animal can release um, certain um, feel-good chemicals yeah. in our brains, uh, and so that's very, it I is a very comforting. You. Yeah, uh, I can give you, there's actually, um, in the references, there's a, a lot of that information. Oxytocin, dopamine, there's like five or six different chemicals. Yeah, I mean, just to, to, I've, I was at the Children's Center not too long ago, which is where um, youth that have been removed from their families be, uh, by ACS, that's their, uh, the, way, the way station for them. Um, and ACS has a program bringing dogs in to the Children's Center to, to help um, you know, alleviate the stress. So it's, it's, it's you know, physiologically proven. Yeah, I mean, there are also programs where um, animals are brought into senior centers yeah. and uh, where people who experience Alzheimer's and are basically shut out from the outside world will start to engage mm -hmm. with people, with, uh, with the animal, with people. They'll talk. They'll, um, it's like they come alive again. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I'll switch you. Good afternoon. My name is Harold Moss. I'm the director of Beacon of Hope, a division of Catholic Charities Community Services of the Archdiocese of New York. This testimony is provided on behalf of the agency's division Beacon of Hope and based on extensive experience working with formerly homeless individuals with serious mental illness. This testimony is offered in support of 4435 and 4422. Beacon of Hope's Stabilization Bed Program was created in June 2016 under a partnership between Catholic Charities and Bowery Residents Committee through the New York City Department of Homeless Services. The program was a direct response to the Mayor's Office initiative to partner with faith-based faith organizations to help decrease the rise of the number of chronic street homelessness in the city. Beacon of Hope delivers comprehensive case management services with a focus on securing permanent housing. Despite incentives and the perceived advantages of more permanent housing, however, many of the stabilization bed residents are reluctant to move from the program. However, we believe that the stabilization program model is effective as we accept the fact that we are working with residents who have decades of deeply entrenched behaviors and a myriad of personal challenges, including medical and psychiatric conditions which have not been stabilized. So too, many of the residents may be overwhelmed by the massive undertaking associated with recovery and or ambivalent about change. We believe that patience, consistency, objectivity, support, and most of all, compassion may still be in our best interest for reaching this very difficult to treat population. And we believe that it is only through intensive, consistent, and timely case management services that this work can be successful. As such, we fully support the bill requiring case management services be provided to the street homeless once they are identified as such. Jumpstarting the recovery process while someone remains homeless could have a meaningful impact on an individual's experience in a stabilization bed program. By transferring case management services instead of initiating in initiating them, the individual may be more hopeful, recovery-oriented, have a shorter length of stay, and have less long-term dependence on emergency services and systems. Importantly, jumpstarting the recovery process with case management service has the potential to reduce the trauma of the homeless experience. To this end, we also support the bill that would set 30 days as a maximum time that HRA could require a street homeless applicant to have received case management services to become eligible for rental assistance programs. The availability of such assistance would free up a backlog for beds at the stabilization bed program as those who receive such financial assistance are placed more directly into housing programs. 
and those individuals who have specialized needs can be served by more intensive case management services such as those provided in our program. Thank you. Thank you so much. I knew I knew that there was a, a program in 2016. It was 16, no. yes. I don't, I don't know if anyone else did it other than you guys. I don't know. I wasn't there at the time, but yeah. we've had it for almost four years yeah, now. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad to see that that's working. I'm glad to see that they're revisiting the model. We are, and we're very interested in developing more stabilization bed programs. Yes, thank you very much. I appreciate the good work that, that you all do at, at Charities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, okay, I'm going to call the next panel. Uh, Eric Lee, Home Services United. Eric. Giselle Ruthier and Josh Goldfein, Coalition for the Homeless, Legal Aid. Um, and then I'm going to call up three more names and um, if, if uh, from Legal Services, if you guys can kind of swap in, if that's okay. Julius, uh, Julia Oaken from Brooklyn Defenders. Deborah Berkman from. Nilag and Raji Adayathu Man, uh, Mangalai from New York County Defenders. Sorry if I mangled the name. Um, so if you guys, if you want to, you can uh, let's see, have a seat. Um, stand by. Hi, my name is Giselle Ruthier. I'm the policy director at the Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, we submitted joint testimony with the Legal Aid Society, and we welcome this opportunity to testify before the council about Outreach NYC and street homelessness more broadly. I want to start with the Outreach NYC. Uh, Mayor de Blasio's Outreach NYC initiative comprises multiple policy shifts, none of which address the true cause of homelessness, a lack of affordable, safe, and appropriate housing. The policies outlined in Outreach NYC, along with several other related street homelessness initiatives announced by the, by the mayor during the latter half of 2019, may seem innocuous, but they actually represent an underlying shift toward the criminalization of homeless New Yorkers. Taken together, these policies create a vast multi-agency surveillance system to monitor homeless individuals who seek refuge in the transit system and bed down in the streets as part of a broader strategy to treat homelessness as a quality of life issue for non-homeless New Yorkers. Outreach NYC consists of several distinct policies, including training nearly 20,000 city workers to identify and report homeless individuals they see during the course of their work duties, uh, and establishing a joint command center that actively tracks homeless people through CCTV and deploys outreach teams or NYPD to engage with them. This center and its cameras are actively monitored by the NYPD in real time. Outreach NYC is the wrong approach to street homelessness because it does not address the root causes of homelessness or treat our neighbors on the streets with dignity. The missing solutions to homelessness are simple, supportive housing, affordable housing, low threshold shelters. Instead of embracing these solutions to the scale needed, Mayor de Blasio has emphasized surveillance of New Yorkers who sleep on the streets and in the subways. The requirement that a vast army of city workers report on the locations of homeless individuals as part of their job duties, coupled with the implementation of real-time CCTV monitoring of homeless people by the NYPD, are policies that serve only to turn New York City into the big brother dystopian society envisioned in 1984. 
Increased contact with law enforcement for quality of life issues is not only unwelcome by homeless New Yorkers, but it's actively harmful to individuals whose freedom, finances, and ability to obtain housing could be directly impacted for years to come as a result, to say nothing of the trauma inflicted of such, by such encounters. We urge the city to immediately end surveillance of homeless New Yorkers through the Joint Command Center and the city worker reporting requirement. We also repeat our recommendation from a few months ago that the city immediately cease the subway diversion program and administrati administratively clear all quality of life summonses that were issued to the hundreds of individuals targeted over the past few months. Um, because of limited time, I want to have my colleague uh, Josh talk about the legislation at hand today and some housing solutions, but there's one thing I wanted to respond to uh, that came up in the testimony today, and that was with respect to safe havens being more appealing to folks on the streets. I think that's something that is universally known, um, and one thing that we have talked with DHS about and we urge the administration to do is actually think about how they've crafted their regular DHS shelter system um, and why they could not implement some of the policies that make safe havens more attractive and appealing to people into that bigger shelter system. So having flexibility of rules, having flexibility around curfew, uh, get rid of getting rid of DHS PD, making the system more welcoming. And so that's something uh, I would encourage the city to actively pursue. Thank you very much. As you said, um, some simple solutions. are not doing. Um, and then just to your comment about 1984, I hadn't really thought of it. That's kind of an, in general in our society, an over, overused uh, analogy. In this instance, I think it's actually like, I think this actually is very much like 1984, where you're just sitting there minding your own business, and then somebody who works for the government spots you, calls it into a command center, <coughs> and then a policeman comes out and threatens to give you a ticket. I think that, yeah. that actually probably like did happen. In, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I'm Josh Goldfein from the Legal Aid Society. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. As Giselle said, we submitted joint written testimony with Coalition for the Homeless um, uh, on the theme of uh, common sense solutions. I think the, the four bills that were on the council's uh, calendar for today are all common sense solutions. We support them. Um, they're, uh, you know, we, we certainly people need more services and access to housing as soon as possible. Um, and um, but we also. Uh, want to affirm, you know, particularly on a day when uh, simultaneously in this building there's a hearing going on in the Senate about uh, housing, uh, statewide housing solutions, um, that permanent housing is, of course, uh, the number one resource that all of our clients need. So um, we have on the table right now um, HSS, which is a, a, a bill that's uh, pending in the legislature, and the council has affirmed its support for that, and we appreciate that. Uh, there's a new um, also a new proposal from Senator Kavanaugh, Senator Prasad, for a statewide Section 8 program um, that would uh, also provide vouchers that would not be linked to um, you know, public assistance benefits. Um, uh, so we need all these kinds of solutions to be in place. Um, we need the uh, commitments that were made from the city and the state for supportive housing um, to be delivered um, so that we have places for people to go. Um, we need a, a, a Supportive Housing Tenants Bill of Rights so that people who are in those placements know what their rights are. Um, and um, uh, the, um, you know, most, most crucially to solving the problem, as we all know, the answer is permanent housing. And uh, we want to just keep everybody focused on, on those solutions as well. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Eric Lee. I'm the Director of Policy and Planning for Homeless Services United. Uh, thank you, Chair Levin and the Council for letting me testify today. Uh, I wanted to first echo both your points, uh, Giselle and Josh, uh, that your points are well taken. I'm going to jump into the legislation um, that was suggested. Uh, for intro 1902, uh, HSU strongly supports the effort to reduce barriers for shelter and better serve the needs of homeless families and individuals. Uh, we applaud the solutions that were put forth by you, uh, Chair Levin, and Speaker Johnson with the comprehensive case for change. I'm trying to think through really client-centered, comprehensive wraparound services, expanded safe havens, more medical respites, a lot of the things that we uh, already heard about today. Um, in terms of 1902, we fully support the idea that individuals who are verified street homeless should receive DHS case management services in a timely manner. Um, in fact, they already do under current policy. So to that end, we're not sure whether um, this would actually make this legislation would actually make it a timelier provision given that outreach staff use clinical training to engage and assess the to the best of their professional ability whether someone's street homeless 
and what their individual needs are. And then upon verifying their, their homeless status as street homeless, they're then on the outreach team's caseload. Um, where we feel there could be an opportunity to improve case management services for street homeless could be greater collaboration and information sharing among all agencies, government partners, both DHS and non-DHS uh, providers that work with these street homeless individuals. Um, street homeless outreach programs utilize Street Smart and Cares databases to track individuals, um, but non-DHS providers do not have a formal access to that and they don't have any way to actually know if someone's known to DHS when they interact with them. So they call and they, and they may or may not get someone to answer that question, but they can't route them back to care. So they can't say, oh, you actually have a safe haven bed. Maybe you should go back there before it gets given away. Or you're this close to being uh, uh, registered as chronic. So we don't want to put you in some other situation which would actually reduce your options of getting placed. Um, let's see here. For 1903, uh, HSU supports the shortening of the caseload requirement from 90 to 30 days for city FEPS el eligibility for street homeless. Um, that said, outreach providers have expressed to us that the majority of individuals that they serve that are not yet chronic do have significant challenges such as act act active substance abuse and are best served in supportive housing to ensure long-term stability. So in order to really make sure that this shortened caseload requirement is a viable option, people that are being placed in permanent housing need to have robust services to community-based wraparound care and that there's uh, transitional services to maintain this ability to make sure uh, long-term. Um, in terms of 1483 and 1484, HSU supports reasoning that individuals and families should, whenever possible, be able to bring their pets with them into shelter. Um, but we do caution that implementing this policy without extensive planning and research could be pro problematic. Um, we need to really, with the DHS shelter system, priori prioritize the welfare of all families and individuals in the programs, both with and without pets. Um, some immediate challenges, I'm, I'm just going to try to go through these super quickly here. Uh, single adult shelters are going to be especially problematic given the physical layout, shared dorm space, congregate settings, you're going to have multiple people in a room, two pets can literally start fighting with each other. Um, there was also a really unfortunate story that came out today from Gothamist about a woman, or sorry, a seven-year-old girl on the Upper West Side who got bit in the face by a, a dog when trying to give a street homeless individual a dollar yesterday, so that where we don't want to create undue concern where there is, we do, we, there can be cases where things can happen, where if a pet isn't familiar with someone, staff worker or someone else in the building, bad things can happen, as well as if there's allergic or asthmatic reactions. And then given the low vacancy rate in shelters in general, whether this might have an undue reaction where you're going to have involuntary shelter transfers when you, pets don't get along or if one person is allergic and then all the other things with that. And then just in terms of funding for this, thinking through uh, funding for pets either for food or welfare if they can't afford it themselves, possibly needing more additional funds for additional uh, cleaning f uh, staff in order to clean up after the pets if there's problems in the shelter to make sure everything's clean, capital repairs if there's damage from the pets or if they need to build out extra spaces for like uh, like uh, places for pets to, pets to play given that they can't leave shelter and they need to like take them out to walk at 11 p.m. at night or something like that. Um, and so given all those concerns, we feel that uh, that intro 1484 should be implemented with enough time to really collect uh, sufficient data to give 1483 a very thoughtful uh, enactment. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Deborah Berkman, and I'm a senior staff attorney in the Public Benefits Unit and the Shelter Advocacy Initiative at NILAG. Uh, we want to thank uh, Chair Levin, Committee Council, for this opportunity to testify, and we also want to thank Chair Levin for the recognition of the report NILIG recently put out, and we're very proud of that. So I had prepared a lot of testimony, but I won't go through things that people have said over and over again. But one thing I don't think anyone has mentioned yet is that many of my clients who are street homeless are actually forced into street homelessness by DHS's own el eligibility processes. Families, even adult families, so like two adults who are together without any children, looking to enter children must provide a complete history of all the places they've lived in the last one to two years. But for the chronically homeless, this burden is especially onerous. The process then requires that each place that's listed be verified by outside contacts. Even for periods of street homelessness, clients are expected to provide contacts so that DHS can verify that the client was living on the street at any given time. 
If the verification contacts don't answer the phone, or if DHS can't speak with them, then the clients are found ineligible for shelter for not cooperating with the investigation, and then they have to reapply, returning to an intake center every 10 days and spending 10 to 20 hours waiting for a new temporary shelter placement. I have clients who have gone through intake every 10 days for the last year, and they still haven't been found eligible for shelter because of this process. Additionally, if DHS determines that they're investi in their investigation that clients have a so-called alternative housing option, even if the clients have proof the purported option is not available to them, DHS will deny them shelter and the clients can return to intake for at least 30 days unless they have some form of new evidence. This means that when DHS believes clients have another place to sleep, even if the clients have been forbidden from returning to the suggested address, or if that address poses health risks or is out of state, the clients are forced into street homelessness. If someone were not in fact homeless, they would not seek shelter and they would not subject themselves to the trauma of the shelter intake process. I have several clients who have found the eligibility process so traumatizing that they left the system and either opted for street homelessness or went into unsafe uh, and unsanitary housing. I've seen clients with disabilities face noticeable deteriorations to their health because of the eligibility process. There are several other DHS practices that uh, I see routinely in my practice that uh, cause shelter to remain accessible for many who need it. Uh, one's already been mentioned, it's the curfew policies and the prohibition on bringing in outside food. I, additionally, intense policing of shelters and the aggression of shelter staff towards residents can make the shelter violent and frightening for residents. And I have many clients who choose street homelessness over shelter simply to avoid interactions with shelter staff who have been known to verbally and physically abuse my clients. Shelters are often inaccessible for clients who use wheelchairs or other assistive devices, and these clients often report broken elevators and facilities that are impossible to navigate in a wheelchair, even when the shelters are labeled accessible. Uh, shelters often restricted for homeless, transgender, or gender non-binary clients who are at times prevented from living in the shelter for the gender with which they identify. DHS wouldn't need increased outreach services if shelter eligibility policies were less restrictive. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Julia Okin, and I am the Affordable Housing Specialist at Brooklyn Defender Services. Thank you for your time today. So Brooklyn Defender Services supports intros 1483 and 1484 for a number of the reasons already elaborated today. We also support intros 1902 and 1903, which are directed at increasing services for street homeless individuals, and I want to talk a little bit more about that. So the street homeless population in New York has been both situationally and systemically cut off from the types of supportive services that we know are essential in getting people into stable living situations. Limiting the kind of support that caseworkers provide, mainly to shelter residents, ignores this critical subset of our homeless population who often require those services most. For that reason, BDS is in favor of both extending case management services to street homeless individuals, as well as limiting the time that they must wait to access those rental subsidies. Just this week, I met with a 56-year-old woman who was, for the first time in her life, street homeless. She lost her apartment after becoming unemployed and failing to make rent, and since June had been living out of her car, until that too was seized pursuant to an arrest. Now she is afraid to enter shelter. Given the city's current policies, I had to tell this woman that even though she has no money, even though she's living on the street and her possessions have been taken, even though it's the middle of winter, she can't even get a housing voucher and begin to look for apartments until she has been receiving DHS services for almost three months. We can't hope to solve homelessness if we have a policy on our books that force New York's most vulnerable communities to proactively seek out this type of assistance while in crisis and then be forced to wait months while on the street before receiving any funding. While BDS supports today's legislation, we believe it needs to go further. The chronically street homeless should receive housing vouchers at the start of their case management rather than 30 days in. We also believe that this policy should be extended to all shelter residents as well who currently still have to wait in shelter for 90 days before receiving a voucher. There also needs to be an increase in funding, as people have talked about today, for housing relocation specialists in shelters. 
And perhaps most importantly, there needs to be a substantial increase in housing voucher amounts and an increase in the enforcement of source of income discrimination laws in New York City if we want our homeless population to truly be able to use the programs that they are eligible for. So I thank you for your time and consideration of our comments. Thank you very much. By the way, I, uh, on the 90 days versus 30 days for in shelter, yeah. I um, recently went back and I, uh, sorry? Josh, I, I, I could say to uh, Josh and Giselle from, from Legal Aid, I went back, I found Legal Aid and Coalition's policy positions back in 2011 when Steve Banks was the attorney, uh, attorney in charge at Legal Aid, and that was Legal Aid's position back then. <laughs> so we should remind the commissioner next time we see him that he once had that position himself. So he should, he should stick to it. Yeah. Thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay, you may begin. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you, Chair Levin. Uh, my name is Raji Neat Manglam. Um, anytime I see someone with a piece of paper and they look perplexed, I know it's me, be it in the dentist's office or, uh, or in, in a driver's license I office. Thought. No, that's quite all right. Uh, it's one of the longest names. Um, I'm a forensic social worker at uh, New York County Defender Services. Um, I'm also a New York State licensed social worker with a background in um, community mental health. And uh, so for me, it was very interesting to sort of hear that discussion about danger to self or others. Um, um, and also about Kendra's law, but particularly the conversation about danger to self or others kind of brought to my mind about where we place the problem in terms of individuals versus uh, structural inequity, uh, inequity and finding for solutions in the, in the wrong place. Um, I am here particularly to rep represent frontline social workers like myself and my colleagues working directly with clients who are tangled up, as we've been talking about, in the scary web of the criminal justice system. So majority of our clients are homeless um, or really on the verge of becoming homeless again. And it's really my deepest hope today that this hearing is going to be a watershed moment uh, for this pandemic of homelessness. Um, and also for that it plagues our city and it should be plaguing our collective conscience here. Um, I also want to bring why am I here? Because social workers are already in the crossfire of the new bail reform laws um, and also on the city in the city's ongoing housing crisis. Uh, basically, our roles are shifting swiftly as we speak as this bail reform is rolling out. Uh, first, let's make it clear it was our intention uh, that clients not be held in jail, right? We wanted them to be out, um, as, uh, and especially, however, at the same time, it presents immediate challenges for homeless clients who will not have three meals and a cot. Um, and then secondly, their homelessness is going to precipitate their cycling in and out of the criminal justice system for all of the things that uh, previous speakers have spoken about. And it's going to just happen more hastily. And then third, we social workers are also now caught in this um, highly, highly under-resourced and fragmented system that we're talking about in terms of services. Um, you know, I'm just going to use an example. One of the weeks, just a few weeks ago, I was assigned seven clients um, in, in that week, and three of the seven were homeless, and two others were on the verge of homelessness. Um, so, but like any other good social worker, I take a deep breath, I turn, try to turn my rage and other sense of helplessness into trying to be compassionate I kind of understand that they have the same strong feelings, except at a whole new level of trauma and intensity. So um, I will say that's because there's just, as everybody said, there's just way too few options that are safe, affordable, and permanent in terms of housing, uh, which kind of, which really puts our homeless clients in an impossible situation. It's, it's almost as if uh, social workers are being asked to be magicians. Everyone's coming to us for food, shelter, and clothing. We can do the food and the clothing part. In fact, thanks to my supervisor, we have a closet that's stocked with shoes, socks, clothing, and food. However, we're not able to stock the closet with housing. So that's part of our problem. Make no mistake, um, I'd like to close by offering a few no-brainer solutions uh, to the problem that we're talking about. Uh, first is that we, everyone said, we need significantly more effective and simplified housing options. Uh, we also need um, facilities that have um, on-site staff and services 
Um, so that, that should come with the housing. And then the second one is that we definitely need more social workers at public defender offices such as ours to help manage um, uh, what, what we're really facing at this time. And then also we're asking for integrated, coordinated, comprehensive mental health and substance treatment coordinated with housing options, which also have to be community-based, culturally sensitive and trauma informed. Um, and I think the last piece, which is probably most important to make any of these worthwhile, is that we need better systems of coordination between service providers across various city agencies and organizations. For example, why can't we have an integrated intake system, assessment system that's centralized and standardized across and portable across agencies? Why is it that the client has to answer the same question 80,000 times across agencies? And I also want to close with second, so that could be a simple solution which we can figure out uh, in terms of coordination across really with agencies. DHS and health and hospitals. Yes, yeah. exactly. And then the uh, also, you know, someone comes to me through the court system, and I do an intake, and then the person says, "Look, you're going to send me now to a drop-in shelter. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to ask me the same hundred questions all over again." And then the last thing I'll say, I'll close with this: I second someone who said that social work education is really about meeting people where they are, physically, metaphorically, and psychologically. Um, and so the idea that we have to really talk about whether we meet someone's short-term needs versus long-term needs is really not dignifying them by listening to what they really ask for. We ask people what they need, and they very well know what they need. And the idea is to build authentic and lasting connections with our clients so that we can actually try to address what it is that they've been asking us for a long time. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to this panel. I look forward to working with you all in the days ahead. I'm going to call the next panel, um, but we're going to take a, a couple minute break. Um, um, but the next panel is uh, L'Oreal Madonna Moore, Marilyn Galfin, Adita Burkrant. And, uh, and, Steve, and Steve Gruber. And Allie Feldman, but I don't know if I've seen Allie here. So we're just going to take a couple minute break.
the real Slade. <laughs> Okay. Welcome back, everybody. Thank you. Uh, so we'll start with L'Oreal. If that's, is that if that's okay? If you want to. Okay. Just make sure to speak into the microphone. Identify yourself for the record, and make sure the red light is on. Um, yeah. Hello? Okay. Um, okay. Just want you guys to know this has been, like, three days in the working. Um, okay. This is a quote by Mother Teresa that always kind of resonated with me. We think sometimes that poverty is only being hungry, naked, and homeless. The poverty of being unwanted, unloved, and uncared for is the greatest poverty. We must start in our own homes to remedy this kind of poverty. My name is L'Oreal Madonna Moore, AKA Oreo's mommy. I understand if you don't remember his name, as he is unforgettable. I'm here to share my story. It's unlike any you have heard before, and yet like so many you have. My whole life, I have only ever wanted one thing, to love and be loved deeply. I always knew I could only give that kind of love to one person, so I would end up spending years looking for that person, which would bring me to New York City, three weeks shy of my 21st birthday. I had no idea what was ahead of my innocent self then. I remember that desperate aching deep in my gut for love. Eventually, I would come to realize the only person who would ever love me like that is myself. This realization would change my outlook on love forever, being now I know humans cannot be trusted. I lost my job and ended up losing the room I was renting, but a friend offered me to stay with him. And during this time, I realized that desperation for love never really left me. My brain was just trying to protect me, so there I was, again, longing for love I'll never get. Um, I've always believed in destiny, so when I was asked to leave because the fear of this friend and his roommates losing their apartment for my illegal residency, I had no choice but to go back to the homeless shelter, where I realized something in me has broke, and I will never be the same. With nothing to lose, I begged on the streets where I was offered a job, where I saved and moved out of the homeless shelter into a room. Six months later, my lease was up, so I started looking for a new room, always checking if pets are allowed, until in April 4th, I found, oh wait, I went through my savings and spent my last thousand dollars on a room that took pets. April 4th, the next day, I brought home Oreo after looking all day on Craigslist. One week later, I would unexpectedly have a mental breakdown from the year and a half I spent working under a horrible boss in a soul-sucking industry. I started begging, hoping I could make enough for the rent. That didn't work out. And I literally found no resources for people with pets. But the guy that I got Oreo from offered for me to stay with him. So out of desperation, I did. And over the next three months, I learned about Oreo's past and trauma. And I would take him with me every day to go beg for money with the plan to save and get an RV and travel and live life. But life is funny like that because things happen that you don't expect and that you don't anticipate for. So you just have to roll with it. And then... On the streets, I realized that what I had been looking for my whole life, I could never get from humans, but Oreo gave it to me. He didn't judge me, he didn't use me, he didn't want anything but food and my love. So I, I then realized that as long as I have him, it's gonna be okay, nothing matters. It don't matter where we are or what's happening. It'd be 18 degrees outside, it's snowing, you know? But me and him are just under the blankets, 
and we're, we're warm and he's snoring and I smell his fart and I'm just like, stop. And it, I just, I, I had 18 degrees and snowing and I, I'm in front of Starbucks on, on blankets with nothing. And I never felt so happy. I had so much peace than when I was there. Never. I felt okay. I wasn't scared. I wasn't hurting. I was just watching the snow with him in my arms. And so much happened, you know. There was people trying to hurt me, and he defended me. And he, he, he proved his love and loyalty. And I had nothing nothing without him I literally I literally would have killed myself literally because I have nothing so Oreo has given me a reason like even the simplest I can't kill myself because no one's gonna love and take care of him like I will <laughs> sorry so uh, that was something that that I always thought about like you know as far as it gets I can never leave because no one's going to make his food the way I do, you know? I know how he likes it. And no one's going to play with him like I do. No one gets Oreo like I do. And I feel jealous thinking of someone else loving him. So Oreo essentially gave me life that I, that I, I never, thank you, that I never thought I would have, you know? So being, being in a position to have to choose between that love that you never had you now have and being warm and dry I obviously chose the love <laughs> and um you know I, I just want to say that um <laughs> I just want to say that um in this day and age it's hard to believe that this is a reality that there's no resources and I remember when I was banging on the street I would get into conversations and um, people could not believe that there's nothing. And, and and there's nothing, like there is no help. And the police would come because someone would call because they said Oreo's being aggressive. He's not aggressive, it just doesn't like strange people walking up to him trying to touch him. He doesn't know who you are. And so the police would come. <laughs> and then they would say, you know, you know, we are poor. They have to reply. They're just doing their job. I get that. Um, you know, most of the time they whatever. But then they would say, you can't be here, because now you're creating an issue for this business. So, um, where am I going to go? I don't know. But you can't be here. So, I had a system where I would pack up from that spot and go across the street, Starbucks. That was my under the scaffolding. That was the rain day spot, or the where I go when the police say I can't be there. Then I wait a couple hours, or if I'm have the energy, if I don't have the energy, I'll just wait that night, and the next day I would come back. Um, and that's literally how I did it, ping pong back and forth. Um, and somebody at Starbucks would call and complain, "You can't be here. Go back to Dwayne Reed." <laughs> so it was just a, a constant, you know. You know, I tried to sleep in an ATM thing and chase. The police were called, woke me up. You know, so it's just like, it's mind boggling how like literally there's nowhere for me, like literally. And, and, and I have this dog, this, and he's like, he is literally the solution to all my problems, but in a way, the cause of all my problems. I'm out here on the street because of him, but you know, he, he gives me this something that I have never found. Like it's just, it's odd that, that I'm in that situation, I have to choose. Um, and anyway, so I just want to say that having the option to have your dog with you is more than just, you know, a luxury as it's considered. Only people that have money that can afford a dog should have a dog. And when in reality, a dog is more than just a pet. He literally will keep people sober. They'll be sober just, just to be, you know, able to be there for him. He keeps them love and comfort and, and, and security and safety, protection, um, purpose. Like, just it, the list goes on. Like, literally. It's so psychologically impactful. And there's so much research out there that I've looked at that I won't even get into because then we'll be here for three hours. But literally, it's scientifically proven that, you know, 
this bond between animals and, and humans is, is real and intense. And, you know, all the research and everything that goes into it, I just, that describes me, that describes me and Oreo. All of it made sense, all of it clicked. And that's when I was like, so this thing I have, it makes sense and it's not just me. And like, and then I'm like, this is crazy, you know? This is, a, this is, this is truth. So long story short, um, now me and Oreo are in a room, a single room in a, a shelter. Um, that is not normally accommodating to animals. Um, they have a chihuahua, and then there's Oreo, a 70 pound pit bull mix, who people have been, they complained. I had to have a sit down with the director. They were uncomfortable with his presence. And um, through that and safety, you know, and every, the legal, whatever, so I have to have him muzzled while he's in the building, which, whatever, okay, safety, I get it. But it's it just, you know, it's just, it goes to show like, like it's just frustrating that, you know, he has to be like, he's, he has to have this vest on that says do not pet. He has to have the muzzle on. He has to have like all this, you know, just, and he's, he's miserable. He's just mocking him to steps like, I'm like, go, just go. You stop and try and take it off. You're wasting time. We could be there already. So we get up to the room and he's just, so when I take it off, he's, he shakes and then he runs and grabs his toys and he's just, he's playing like, and you know, it's, He's free, you know, he likes to be free and naked. That's Oreo, free and naked. So <laughs> having all these things on him, it just drives him crazy. But, you know, I, I, I remember h how he was in the street and I remember how he was in the room. Like in the street, he was a different dog. He was on defense, constantly on alert, defense, you know, as I was, but he was, you know, has teeth. Um, so he was, you know, defensive of everybody that even walked by us. And, and now he's in the room, like he lays out on his back. He didn't used to do that. He would always be curled up, you know, like this, but he lays on his back. He's just way comfortable. And I was thinking like, that's crazy that, that he's being forced to be aggressive out of fear because there's no options. And so I'm, I'm just, just want people to know that, you know, it's not, it's not that he's suffering. I'm not forcing him to be there. I'm not like irresponsible, making bad choices. I'm not using him as a scam to get more money. You know, I'm not like, you just, you see it and you, you think things, but you should know that like there's so much more to it, you know? Um, and I mean, yeah, like he's just, he's just like really my whole existence right now. And he's part of my identity. I don't know who I am without Oreo, you know? He, <laughs> Uh, he was taken from me for two weeks, you know, and I, I literally was lost. I never felt so lost. And when I got him back, I, I felt like, wow, I can never go through that again. So I told myself, I've never put him in a situation where I have to, like, he has to make a choice. You know what I'm saying? It's not that serious. If someone's coming with a knife, okay, maybe, but anything else, I, I'm never going to do that. So, yeah, so basically, you know, I feel like it's destined. Everything I've been through has to be for something, you know? And, and, and I thought I had a plan, I always had plans, they never worked out, and then so this is what came at me and I didn't expect it, and this, it just feels right, like this is it. This is Oreo and me, and we have a future, and it's, it's to, to, to share people and educate them about like, things that, you know, second guess. You think you know, but you have no idea. And that's kind of my motto. Things, things are not as they appear, <laughs> you know? So that's, yeah, that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Yay, thank you. Where, where is Oreo right now? Oreo is sitting, probably laying on my bed with a cone around his neck, miserable, because he decided to jump down three steps in front of me and tore off his toenail in the back. Yeah, yeah that's Oreo. Yeah. So I'm walking back and I see all his blood and I'm like, oh, it happened. are you bleeding? Yeah. Dog toenails bleed a lot, okay? Just want to let you know. It, I, was, I, was fucking, I was mortified. I was like, there was blood on my shirt on the plane. They're like, what's going on? What did you do? How did this happen? Where was I? And so uh, some, you know, generous people, connections I have made, you know, have, have helped me, you know. Like, she, lovely lady, was able to get me food, you know, when I needed it. Um, anyway, so he's, he's on the bed probably laying there waiting for me to come back with the cone around his neck, like, looking like he's dead. That's, I swear, when I open the door, that's a look. Where have you been? Where have you been? <laughs> I'm, glad, I'm glad that you're so, together. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's good now. He's good. Thank you. Thank you no problem. Much. Turn this off now. Like, who's next? Or did I turn it off? Uh, whoever wants to go next. You want to go next? Sure. Okay.
Turn it off. Are you Hi. Um, how does one follow that? <laughs> um, I'm Marilyn Galfin, Voices for Shelter Animals. We support Intro 1483, legislation to provide pet-friendly shelters and alternative housing that allows people to stay with their pets for the best possible psychological and emotional outcomes. The story of a dog Midnight and his family could have had such a positive outcome with Intro 1483. Midnight lived with children from as young as five years old to teenagers. The family were evicted. They lost everything, and with no other recourse, they had to surrender their dog to the New York City Animal Care Centers, only to end up being killed. Her owner described her as fr him as friendly, gentle, and playful with children. A picture of him hiding scared under his sheet in his cage still haunts me, as well as to imagine how devastating it would be for this family if they learned of their pet's fate. This past December, on an unbearably cold night in my Chelsea neighborhood, I saw a group of three homeless people huddled together with their dogs, who they buried deep under mounds of blankets, attempting to protect them from sub-freezing temperatures. And L'Oreal and her dog Oreo was one of them. And that's how we are now, um, I guess, friends, I say, as <laughs> friends. Um, it is not only heartbreaking, but it is unconscionable that there is no alternative for them to go anywhere with their pets. And no one should ever have to choose between a warm bed and a shelter for themselves or surrendering their pet to a kill shelter or give their pet away. When an animal enters the New York City Animal Care Centers, another otherwise well-behaved animal can develop fear-based behavior issues from the trauma of separation and the nature of the shelter environment as in Midnight Story with the possibility of the same outcome. Separating a homeless person from their animal companion can cause severe psychological distress for both. It may exacerbate the sense of loss of control of their lives, especially when in their most vulnerable state. This bond can be the most important foundation for a homeless person, giving them a sense of responsibility for another life, motivating them to seek the help they need to put them back on the path to self-sufficiency and personal responsibility. Their best friends are, their pets are their best friends, a family member, someone who gives them comfort, and all the other things that L'Oreal has expressed to you today. They need to be kept together. Even victims of domestic violence would rather stay in a dangerous situation than risk their lives rather than leave their pets. In Hurricane Katrina, a poll found that 44% of people chose not to evacuate because they did not want to abandon their pets. Many lives, animals, and humans were lost, which led to major changes to state and federal laws regarding the evacuation of pets during disasters. In a Wallet Hub study, New York City placed 90th, making it the 11th least pet-friendly city in the nation. Less than 23% of the city's rental units are press friend, pet friendly, the sixth smallest proportion in the nation. Ultimately, it's critical that this city addresses this pets and housing discrimination and make sure any new affordable housing is pet friendly as the, base long, as the best long-term solution to the homeless human animal crisis. If we are to be a city of compassion, we ask the, the council to pass intro 1483 to create housing that keeps people and their beloved pets together. We also support intro 1484 and all the other legislation presented at this hearing today. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Steve Gruber, and um, I'm the Director of Communications for the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals. Um, I want to first say thank you, Ariel, for, um, L'Oreal, for your courage in speaking today, and you said a lot of really uh, important words. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Chair Levin and members of the committee for the opportunity to speak in support of Intro 1843 and Intro 1840, 18, uh, 1484. Uh, since 2003, the Mayor's Alliance for New York City's Animals has worked to reduce the killing of uh, um, animals in the uh, animal care shelters of New York City. And one of our core objectives was to reduce animal homelessness. Now, one of the best ways to reduce animal homelessness is to keep pe people with their pets. Uh, good for the animals, good for the people. 
Um, you know, it's widely accepted and it's been spoken about much today about the uh, critical um, human-animal bond. It's particularly important during times of crisis and stress, uh, such as homelessness, when people um, um, are facing perhaps one of the worst times of their lives. And for many people, um, their pet's the only source of comfort and stability. Um, in 2006, the Mayor's Alliance created a program uh, that uh, had a, about a 12-year duration of uh, helping pets and people in crisis where we helped uh, with so run by a social worker who worked with people facing different kinds of crises um, uh, including homelessness uh, to find solutions to keep their pets with them uh, b without the support policies in place each case became uh, a challenge um, but we uh, worked you know through them as much as we could and then in 2013 had the opportunity to work with uh, the Urban Resource uh, Institute to uh, in their creating their PALS program and that was really one of a, uh, such a, a major um, and, and visionary program that today does provide for co-housing between animals and, and their people. Um, another instance where um, I've had some uh, very gratifying work is working on the Animal Planning Task Force at the uh, Office with the Emergency Management of New York City. Um, over the years, we created a plan, we uh, implemented a plan that now allows for co-sheltering um, in emergency shelters when uh, uh, disasters are uh, uh, declared. Um, I think the point is that uh, the, the p people who are facing homelessness are in many ways very, uh, have great similarities to people who are facing domestic violence, people who are, um, you know, facing any kind of crisis um, where they're having to leave their home, and they should not have to make a choice between giving up a, val a loved family member and, you um, uh, uh, finding a, a roof over their head. And just one last thing I'd like to say is I think that because the nonprofits are great resources to work with the city to find <laughs> solutions as we did with uh, uh, on the Animal Planning Task Force, ASPCA, um, Animal Care Centers, and numbers of organizations are great resources that can help to provide the solutions, um, help create them. Um, f the funding for that though, sh I, we believe should rest with the city uh, to fund these these shelters that hopefully will be uh, pet friendly. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you to, uh, uh, for the testimony and for all the work that you're doing. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I'm Heather Greenhouse. I'm on the board of Voters for Animal Rights, and I'm speaking on behalf of Allie Feldman Taylor. She's the president. Um, thank you, Councilmember Levin, for introducing this important legislation, intros 1483 and 1484. Uh, I'm just going to read exactly what Allie wrote here. Uh, my name is Allie Feldman, president of Voters for Animal Rights. I also volunteer as a cat rescuer in my neighborhood of Bed Stuy. Today I want to tell you a personal story to illustrate why New York City badly needs resources and protections for people experiencing homelessness and their companion animals. Last year, on a quiet Sunday night, I was at home when there was a knock on my door at 10 p.m. My husband peered outside, saw a woman holding a bag in one arm and holding an orange cat on the other arm and said, I think it's for you. <laughs> I opened the door to a woman who appeared scared, nervous, and relieved. Her name was Lola. She explained that she had just escaped from her abusive husband and needed a place for her cat, Paco, to go safely for a few days so that she could go to a safe haven for herself in New Jersey. She explained that she lives in the neighborhood and had found my apartment by Googling animal shelter bed and my address came up. I invited Lola and Paco inside and explained that despite having an above average number of cats, my apartment is indeed not an animal shelter. Her face sunk. I knew I had to help her. This was an emergency. She could not go back to her apartment with an abusive husband, and the safe haven in Jersey wouldn't take cats. So I agreed to foster her cat for a few days while she, get, while she got settled. Lola came back to visit Paco. We had, we had to schedule her visits at specific dates and times because she was afraid that her husband, who still lived nearby, would see her as he began showing up at her office. A few, a few days of fostering Paco, the cat turned Paco the cat turned into weeks and months as Lola struggled to get back on her feet. 
It is not easy to start over and find affordable, safe housing while working full-time and processing a divorce with an abusive husband who continued to harass and stalk her. The situation was already difficult enough for Lola, but knowing that her cat was in a loving home provided solace to her during an extremely difficult time. Lola and Paco were one of the lucky ones. What would have happened to them if I hadn't been home that night, uh, that night that she knocked on the door? I can't even imagine the alternative. She just so happened to knock on the right apartment door at the right time. What happens to the millions of other women who want to leave domestic violence situations with their companion animals? There are zero programs that provide emergency shelters for victims of domestic violence and their companion animals. And there are zero programs that provide long-term foster care for the animals while their humans are healing and rebuilding their lives. This has to change, and I urge the city council to please take swift action. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, Committee Chair Levin and the committee. Uh, my name is Adita Bernkrant, and I'm the Executive Director of NICLASS. Um, we're an animal advocacy and political action organization founded in 2008, and we're based in New York City with supporters in all five boroughs. And I'm a lifelong New Yorker, and I live in Queens. So NICLASS is strongly in support of your bills, intro 1883 and 1884, which would help solve the ongoing problem of homeless shelters shutting out people in need of shelter who are pet owners. Nearly every day and in all extremes of weather, I see homeless people with pets suffering on our streets. In my conversations with many of them and through discussing this pressing issue with other animal advocates, it is very clear that many of these individuals are only out on the street because their dog, cat, or other pet, whom they consider their family member, is prohibited from entering a shelter with them. This puts people already dealing with so much in a heartbreaking dilemma, remain on the streets or abandon their beloved family member. This dilemma is also true of victims of domestic violence who are barred from most shelters if they own a pet. We know that many victims stay in abusive, life-threatening situations because they refuse to give up their pets in order to access a shelter. We must change this. This winter, I tried to help a man desperate to get into a shelter the day a severe storm was to hit New York City. Because he had a dog, he had no options of entering a shelter unless he had emotional support papers for his dog, which he was completely incapable of procuring and certainly not in time for this storm. So he instead was forced to raise money for a hotel room so he and his cherished dog wouldn't have to face the brutal pending storm on the street. Imagine how many other homeless individuals have similar stories like this every day. Um, a recent New York University study confirmed that pet ownership is one of the main barriers to shelter entry. Intros 1483 and 1484 would finally right this wrong and make our homeless shelters more accessible to people in need who have pets by providing pet-friendly shelters and identifying other temporary pet care arrangements that would allow homeless pet owners to keep their pets. NICLASS commends Councilmember Levin and the other bill co-sponsors for being leaders in taking the initiative to create a more compassionate policy for homeless pet owners seeking shelter in our city shelters. We urge the committee to pass these bills. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much to this panel um, and for helping bring such moral clarity to this issue. It's greatly appreciated. Okay, we're going to call back up Josh Dean, representing himself, Linda Mann, Maureen Medina, and Marion Koenig. Good afternoon. My name is Linda Mann, and I am speaking on a, a purely personal note for intros 1483 and 1484. I am a blessed human being. Today, I do not have to decide whether to sleep on the street with my companion animals, Cinnamon and Sweet Pea, 
or go to a shelter and give up the loves of my life. I do not have to make that agonizing choice. It is a no-win situation. How could I possibly decide to subject my sweet, innocent girls to life on the streets? On the other hand, how could I possibly give them up? They are not only family, but for many people, they are the source of emotional support. I cannot even vaguely imagine what it is like to be homeless. We are a city striving to be more compassionate our social conscience demands that we create policies that support the human-animal connection and provide housing and health care for all of New York City residents. Helping that one homeless person who has to decide what to do tonight may not change the world. But for that one person and his or her best friend, the world will certainly be changed forever. Thank you. Do we have to go in order of <laughs> which we're called? <laughs> Thank you so much, Councilman uh, Levin, for this, uh, for all of this. My name is Maureen Medina, and I'm here in support of intros 1483 and 1484. I've worked in social services for the past few years, almost 10 years, with populations experiencing housing crisis. Though there is a right to shelter in New York City, it is not so black and white, and initial entry is conditional. One does not simply choose to enter shelter, and it is in most cases the last resort. Those who make or are forced upon the decision of entering shelter do so with countless factors to consider, like financial status, possible eviction, how to care for themselves and their household, or even just to qualify for housing assistance. There are several entryways, entryway shelters in the city for men, uh, women, and families before they are assigned to a more permanent shelter, and none of those allow for pets. As a former outreach worker, I have never encountered clients in DHS facilities that had their pets with them, though we have fielded many calls and inquiries outside of those facilities about available housing um, allowing for animals. <clears throat> Many people referring, referred to our programs are already facing insecurities and one recurring concern is domestic violence. And they will not leave a dangerous situation until they can ensure the safety of all of their loved ones, including their pets. Regardless of their personal situation, um, the point is that we have housed, to, and I use that uh, how the parentheses very strongly, to many uh, we have too many people without realistically or holistically addressing their needs, most of which lead them to shelter to begin with. In most circumstances, those experiencing housing crises are marginalized uh, and facing both systemic and personal hardship, including physical and mental health conditions, and being forced to separate from their pet is additionally damaging to both the human and the animal. Please do not reduce people to being difficult, picky or non-compliant or not in enough of a dire situation just because they refuse to enter shelter, which again would make them eligible for additional services. If we truly want to address um, homelessness and provide long-term sustainable housing and assistance, especially for this underserved population, we need to acknowledge that many people have pets that they love like family, and it is truly impossible to decide whether to be homeless or to abandon your loved one. Please do not make them choose. Please, DHS, allow pets into shelters. Thank you for, uh, and please support intros 1483 and 1484. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Josh Dean. I'll, I'll be brief as it's been a, a long day. Um, my, my colleagues have done a phenomenal job of, of advocating for housing in the safe haven, supportive housing, affordable housing, you name it. Um, I think that point's been, been nailed pretty well today. And I think uh, the animal welfare community turned out very big today. So thank you all for, for coming out and, and speaking so eloquently about the, the needs for um, homeless pet owners. I want to talk briefly about um, the, the, the short-term needs of folks on the street, because I think that's been overlooked, and, and Craig from Urban Justice touched on that a bit. Um, 
I've got some good news for you, Council Member. I, I texted Bombas about your 10,000 sock request, and they are they are down. They're they're f going to fulfill that request if DHS oh, is up for it. Yeah. So um, the only thing standing between that happening now is is DHS. Bombas is on board. You're on board. Outreach teams are on board. We got to make it happen. Um, uh, it, it's really concerning um, that you know that that hasn't happened yet. Um, I, I could share from personal experience that in, in our initial conversations with DHS, when we raised, you know, what we do and, and shared what we were looking at and asked, you know, how can we work together? The, I, I recall, so, uh, you know, what they asked of us was stop giving out socks. They said it makes it harder to convince people to come off the streets, uh, which is bullshit. Um, if you think that the make or break between coming in off the streets is a pair of socks, you better take a hard look at what you're offering. Um, it, it's really concerning because last year, uh, 148 New Yorkers died while living non-sheltered. Despite the fact that HUD data indicates that only 5% of the homeless population is unsheltered, unsheltered homeless deaths account to 37% of homeless deaths. On the morning of October 5th, we lost Chen Kwok, Anthony Leon Manson, Nazario Vasquez Viagas, and Florio Moran to a tragic and preventable murder. Take a couple seconds for a moment of silence for them. We're seeing the city and state resort to cruel tactics to deter people from staying in public spaces especially where those who are more wealthy or more white tend to spend their time. Here are just a couple examples. Recently, Elizabeth Kim of Gotham has reported that at the West 4th subway station, the MTA removed the backs of the benches to deter people from sleeping there. Number two, our colleagues at the Safety Net Project foiled for data and showed a 44.5% increase since 2017 in displacements, also known as street sweeps or cleanups. Number three, the subway diversion program. I won't say any more. Number four, at the Joint Command Center, which we touched on today, and which I thought Giselle and the Coalition for the Homeless really pointed out its flaws. And then number five, the outreach teams don't give people things. Uh, we talked about that with the socks, but it's freezing cold out. We gotta, if someone doesn't want to come inside because they don't feel safe going to the shelter and we can't offer them a safe haven that night, give them a pair of socks, a warm meal, or a blanket. People are, people are dying. 148 people died last year out on the streets. It's, sorry. I think I've uh, you know, shared my recommendations, uh, our recommendations with you pretty thoroughly. So I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Thank you for contacting Bombas. Yeah. Appreciate it. Anytime, my pleasure. <laughs> Hi, Sam and Kelly, thank you. Uh, my name is Marianne Koenig. I'm a lifetime pet owner, but mostly I am also an animal rescuer. Therefore, I'm in the trenches almost, well, at least every weekend, day and night. I am here to testify that passing intro 1483 is the only choice our society can make. My admiration goes to the City of New York for its persistent work toward achieving pet-friendly shelters. I am aware that the city issued a request for proposals for a shelter that would take pets. That was more than a year ago. I looked into what could possibly be the problem, the barrier. The only tangible reason I could fathom is possibly liability insurance. The city, with the help of ACC and ASPCA, could whittle this cost down by providing, I think, the following during intake proper sized cages for dogs and or cats to be placed next to the owner's bed, outfitted with pads and water bowls. Cages for cats can be outfitted with cardboard litter uh, pans, a cardboard box for the cat to hide. Number two, proper fitting muzzles. Some owners say no, but I, this would solve the problem of people saying fear. We're trying to eliminate why they can't go in. So proper fitting muzzles as a rule when outside room and proper fitting leashes. Volunteers instruct safest way to hold a leash, securely wrapped around wrist. It's a, that's a big problem that could be solved within a minute. 
The last thing would be eco-friendly pet waste bags and dispensers. This is not big cost, but it would really help the animal shelters to take in right away, to take in pets. A homeless person's pet could very well be, as we've all said, their lifeline to caring to exist at all. It could be their last shred of love, perhaps their only shred of love. Meaning when individuals break down, they're not entering with joy, they break down and enter a shelter. It is not with relief or peace, but pain. What if Rusty was here? Where is he? What are they doing? When can I see them? What if? This bill will help humans to get off the street. There is no other answer. There needs to be a no more what if. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. I think it is as simple as that. And I think people can gawk at cages, they can gawk at muzzles, but if it starts the process and solves it, I don't see why not. Thank you so much for those suggestions. Very, very helpful. Thank you to this entire panel. Very, very moving. Thank you. And thank you for staying. <laughs> okay, this is our last panel. It's, huh? it's a big one, though. Uh, Casey Reardon, Caitlin Balajula, uh, Joey. Yeah, he's gone. What is it? He left. Oh, he left. Okay. Uh, Greg Zucker. Okay. Diana Rose and uh, Lori Elmore. Great. Whoever wants to begin. Okay, I'll start. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to testify in favor of intros 1483 and 1484. My name is Caitlin Balagula. I'm a psych student at Hunter College. Additionally, I've conducted mental health research at NYU Langone and Weill Cornell Medicine. At Cornell, I worked with at-risk populations such as veterans and 9-11 responders, many of whom were experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. I come to you as a community member, born and raised in Brooklyn, who cares deeply about New Yorkers and especially about our most vulnerable. I'm also an animal lover. I feel we must do all that we can to help both New Yorkers and animals, and it just so happens that in many cases, this means helping them stay together. I'm gonna to skip over all the empirical evidence showing how great keeping animals and humans together because that was reiterated many, that was reiterated many times. I'm sure many people in this room have experienced the joy that an animal offers. People experiencing homelessness or who are housing insecure face tremendous stress daily. The comfort and companionship that pets provide them is invaluable. Please adopt these measures so that people don't have to choose between having a roof over their head and losing their best friend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Just an, um, I'm, I'm assuming there's plenty of research and literature on the psychological effects of, of companionship from an animal. Yes, I mean, you seem to be well informed about it, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Do I push this? Oh, it's on. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mary Cahill. I'm a nurse practitioner, and I spent 15 years on the medical team of the Bowery Mission at the Free Clinic. I'm actually reading for Casey Reardon. Um, Thank you, council members, for allowing me to testify here today. My name is Casey Reardon, and I'm here as a private individual in favor of proposed legislation 1483 and 1484. Though I am a resident of, New of Jersey City, I am deeply invested in this issue because I recently graduated from NYU's Animal Studies MA program, where I, where I researched people experiencing homelessness with pets in New York City. Over the past year, I surveyed dozens of homeless pet owners throughout New York City with the help of the national nonprofit My Dog Is My Home and found that 46% of surveyed people reported that there was a time in the past year when they wanted to stay in a shelter but could not. Of these, 55% said the main reason was because their animal was not allowed inside. 65% have been denied access to a shelter at least once because of their animal. Finally, 50% reported they would not stay in a shelter unless their animal was allowed inside. 
It's a widespread argument that pets are family members and a responsibility for life. And most of the individuals I worked with over the past year acquired their pets before becoming homeless. By refusing to abandon their animals after losing their homes, these community members are merely living up to the expectations we have for all pet owners. That is, to remain with and care for one's pets regardless of life's hardships. It is my opinion that proposed legislation 1483, 1484 are a critical step towards helping the city achieve its goal of putting an end to street homelessness and bringing all New Yorkers home. Thank you again for allowing me to testify here today. Thank you so much. So um, my name is Diana Rose. Good afternoon. Um, Good afternoon, Council Member Levin and everyone else. Um, ideally, I don't have any speeches planned because I found out about this in the wee hours of the morning. But knowing me and how much I have fought for human rights and animal rights alike, I could not see any other place that I would rather be. So it meant waiting an hour or 17 hours, that's fine. Um, doing personal outreach, not with any agency, but going throughout the city of New York as a native New Yorker. I'm originally from Queens in the 80s and 90s and realizing that the homeless community as a whole was not looked on and as human beings. They were persevered and persecuted in one state and then they were ostracized in another. So encountering these situations where I would sit hours and have conversations with human beings that want anything and everything that any human being deserves along with their animal beings beside them and hearing countless, I do not matter. My animal doesn't matter. On a side note, hopefully looking at animals no longer as property and looking at them as the beings that they are and the reason why until I have the last breath in my body, I will continue to fight for them and for the humans that love them and protect them. Also being um, from an educational background and a wellness background and also a survivor of domestic violence, knowing that I could have possibly been placed in 2018 in a situation that wouldn't have allowed me to bring my companion animals, two of them which are service dogs, into a facility, I would have chosen to be in the streets because I would have never parted ways with my family. And the more that you look at these animals and the connection with their human family, the more 1483, 1484 is prevalent. And on a personal level, it's interesting how the universe works because the young lady sitting beside me, I had conversations with her when she was in the street. And I had the pleasure of meeting Oreo. And when I tell you that she's not bullshitting you, when I tell you the level of respect, adoration, and relationship that these two beings have with one another is incredible. So I thank you, and I hope that before my time is done on this planet that I see that all this beautiful work is not for, for nothing, that it actually takes place, and that we remove the bureaucratic bullshit and we look at humans for what they are and who they are and their animal beings, and again, not as property. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, I just wanted to touch on some things that I found to be really important as I was listening to everybody. Um, I just want to say that um, I was going to looking it up. But, uh, Colorado has um, an animal co-living system in place already, and several of them actually that I've looked at. And from what I read, it was like um, volunteers would tend to the animals in you know, cages that are separate from, and then in the morning you'll get, you know, you'll get your dog whenever you go about your life, but 
um, you know, just because I know that it, it, to have a, a system like this is important and it's crucial that we need to figure it out to where it works and it makes sense in, in, in every way. Because what I, I want to touch on, which nobody has said anything about, um, is that um, I want to say that, um, yeah, well, the one thing was there are no resources like, let's say I'm on the street with my dog, right? You know, that's, that's bad. But if there were just some resources that could make, you know, like there's no vet care. There's no free vet care at all. Nobody offers a, a, a basic exam. Um, so I would not, I, I mean, unless you just know of that. The record, ASPCA is raising their hands. Well, well, I was on the phone with the Humane Society and the AC, I called everybody and I think the ASPCA was $40, it was at like 90 second. And then they, I called and they said, we don't offer exams that's 90 second or whatever. And I was like, maybe it's misinformation, but um, you know, if you bring your you connect off low income, it was low income, right? Low income. Yeah. Program. But it's not free, free. Like absolutely, you pay nothing. It can be. It can be. Okay, but see, that's the thing. So nobody knows that, right? There's people who are homeless. They have dogs. I have, you know, a pit bull, and he's. I found later on he has really sensitivities to food and like the, the environment. You know, his paws get real inflamed. His ear, like, he had a little alopecia. And I'm like, what is this? This is fungus. This is mites. I'm freaking out. I remember making a sign saying need dollar sign number four vet in front of the you know West Village vet, I won't call them out, but I sat there in front of there. And then I moved across where the Starbucks was. And nobody gave me nothing. And you know, and it was literally four vet. Like, you know, and I that's how desperate I was. And long story short, you know, it it, it takes you to a place you don't you don't want to feel desperately anxious and worried about your dog, you know, being sick or whatever. Um, so I mean, that's something, you know, that's available that needs to be like known. Like, and I want to go make flyers and pass them out because I didn't know that. So long story short, that was one thing. Like jackets or coats. You know, if I didn't have so many people that were generous and cared about me and Oreo, like he wouldn't have like as much as he has. You know, so where would you go to get those things? I know the ACC has like the pet. You know, but that's more for people in the homes. You know, so I just feel like there should be more um, services in general for people struggling with their pets because as far as I know it's just like the ACC right so either way that was one thing I wanted to say and then um the Colorado thing and then um okay so the other thing was something I considered for a while was going in because by law if you you know present this is a service animal by law in the establishment can we ask you two questions is this a service animal you say yes what service has he been trained to provide now by law I mean it's, it's a loophole you could lie. They legally can't check or verify, you know? That's what the Marriage and Disability Act is for, right? To protect your right to, you know, not have to display your information. And that was something I consider, but that's illegal, you know? That's lying. And that's a liability for what if something happens, you know? And people, so I, it was just, it was a moment of desperation. But I, I feel like, you know, that's an option. Some people just, you know, what if I just say he's a service dog, right? And that creates a whole other issue out of desperation. That's, that's all I'm saying. Um, and then um, the other thing I wanted to say was um, this is probably the biggest issue I've had with being a homeless person that owns a dog because I own a 70 pound pit bull and he, he is not the typical dog. And on top of being a 70 pound male pit bull, for the most, for literally his whole life, um, he was unneutered. Um, and he has trauma. Dogs have trauma, they can have trauma. So he has uh, trauma with, um, and he also wasn't socialized properly, so he's uh, scared of a lot of things. Big black trash bags, you're walking by, and here he is, hard barking at him, they're like, what's going on? Um, the police he has issues with because the, their uniforms, they're big, they're solid color, and you know, and I guess it's just their presence. Um, Oreo does not like the police. He does not like the MTA workers that wear the yellow vest. Oreo doesn't like um, the Buddha statue on 14th Street. He doesn't like that Buddha statue. So, you know, he, He's scared and he doesn't know what's going on, so that's aggression, right? I mean, time the police have called me on me because they thought he was being aggressive, and then guess what shows up? The police show up. <laughs> so before he's barking and he's been on the show, and I'm just like, please stop, 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 stop. These are not the people you bark at. They're here because you're barking. So it's like, you now if it's a Chihuahua, I'd be like, oh, he's so cute, right? He's, he's a feisty little Chihuahua. So it's like, it's a whole. It's one thing to be homeless with a dog or an animal, but then it's to be homeless with a pit bull is another whole other experience. And then to be homeless with a pit bull that has trauma. <laughs> it's like, how, how, you know what I'm saying? So how can you, how can you 
handle that. Like for a lot of people, you know, it'd be overwhelming. Oreo has climbed over me and huge red scrapes on my legs trying to get to somebody that's too close. You know, like he literally, like it, it, he is scared. And, and so it's, 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 it's difficult to manage a, a dog with trauma. So anyway, that was the thing I was wanted to say. And um, so on that note, I noticed that when I was, I was forcibly removed from the street and I was placed in shelter that was a DHS shelter, but not like a safe haven. Um, the police showed up, it was, a big, it was a big ordeal. But the point I'm trying to make is I was never offered transitional services. So I went through a phase of like shock, I guess. I kept going back to my spot. So I had a room and I stayed out there like 30 degree weather because I don't know, I was just like, I hit, this is where we are, this is where me Oreo are. And then Oreo would bark at me aggressive and he was like, and then when we get back to the room, he's laying on his back, playing with a toy. And it took me like a, a more time than it should have to realize that I have no place in no more. I, you know what I'm saying? So that's something that I, f I feel is crucial because if people have access to like a, a transitional therapeutic, um, you know, setting or um, services, and then they'll be probably more likely to want to stay, you know, all oh, this place is go bad, you know, because you're losing a bit of a freedom, you know, there's a bit of like confidence, you know, like I, it's just, it's different when you're in the street, when you're in the street, you're, you're fearless, you're like, whatever, you know, you, you don't care if people judge you, you're just, you know, you have this like face on, this mask. So trying to take it off can be very difficult. So I just feel like there should be like, there should be transitional services. I thought there was going to be in safe havens, but honestly, you can talk to your caseworker, but she's not like a therapist who specializes in, you know, homeless tr trauma or whatever. Um, because I know for me, being on the street was traumatizing, like just in general. So um, the other thing I want to say was that um, I am I'm so for these bills, all of them actually. Um, but I do want to be honest. Um, I think the system in housing people with pets needs to take into account what type of pet it is, because like I said, he's a 70 pound pit bull and he's, you just, you know, literally walking down the street, Oreo is in front and he clears the path every time. People will, they dodge, they run across the street, um, they see me and they're like already on that side waiting for the car and they're, you know, so they'll literally run in the traffic trying to avoid this pit bull. Um, you know, people split, like they're split. They just, there's a path. I'm like, Noah, like I swear, like Noah's art, like just this me and Oreo. Because of fear, when I first got to the safe haven, they set me down and expressed, there was a lot of people that were expressing uh, fears and concerns because they didn't, his presence. We're talking about he's sitting down with the muzzle. Because he, he just has this miserable, like, you know, face. He's just like, that's Oreo. That's Oreo with a muzzle. But that, 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 <laughs> he's just the fact that he's a pit bull. And it's like, it just, it just, I mean, I'm used to it, but it's like, how could I house Oreo knowing that he has trauma, knowing his personality? He sees another dog, he's, in, you know, he's on guard. So imagine somebody else that has a pit bull, and I have a pit bull, or any other dog, you know, that's a big dog. So how, I mean, muzzles or not, like, you know, dogs are dogs. You know, things are unpredictable, you, you know, it's, it's just, it, I just think that the system should be taken into account, the breed of dog is what I'm trying to say, or the, the type of animal, because, you know what I'm saying? Like, what do you do with someone with, with ferrets, right? Do they, they can't sleep in a cage. It's, yeah. So I just, I'm not, I'm, I'm totally for it. I just strangely illegal. <laughs> yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole backstory with ferret. Oh yeah. Well, I only say it because when I was on the street. Rudy Giuliani, something in the. Oh, okay. I, I don't know about that. All I know is when I was on the street, I knew a girl that was homeless and begged, and she lived in the van with her husband, and she had ferrets, two ferrets, and I remember, um, you know, talking to her through that, and then, mm -hmm. long story short, um, so that's all I'm trying to say is like nobody's ever spoken about like you know. Because him being a pit bull is you, yeah, a huge <laughs> impact on my li life and homeless experience. If he was any other breed, it would be a completely different experience. Yeah, okay? right. People either think he's cute or people either are afraid of him. Yeah. So long story short, that was, yeah. I, I want to like, you know, be a, a part of that. And the other one is, I, you have two other ones, right? 1903 and 1902? Right. Yes. Um, well, introductions though, right? Not, okay. So um, I don't know if anyone spoke on these, but um, 19, 1903 is the 30 day max. So when you, in order to get a caseworker from, um, I was with, you know, Manhattan, I don't know how to say, consortium, consortium, 
Consortium. 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 See, I always say it wrong. They have, you know, like different organizations that help. They have, you know, mm -hmm. so long story short, it's like breaking ground. There's like, you know, Goddard. Yeah. But in order to get a caseworker through one of them, you have to be on the streets or home like for nine months. Yeah. That's like enough time for a baby to be born. Yeah. And, 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 and I mean, that's like, that's yeah. forcing people to be out there. Like, what, why nine months? Like seriously, yeah. Um, and so they, they they come out, they do hours, they check, and they see you. They say, okay, we write you down as account, meaning that we saw you. Now we're verifying that you. So I mean, thirty days is more than enough, you know. Mm -hmm. So long story short, um, and it is it, it there's a lot of you know stress strain on the caseworker. So it took me a long time to even get a caseworker. Yeah. So, but anyways, um, I I I just wanted to to, yeah. to speak on the importance of that bill because I know that the, the, the dogs and shelters is very important, but this one also. Is crucial because Oreo is on the street for months, experiencing trauma every day. And every day they're on the streets, it's another opportunity, you know. So it's just 30 days, you know. It's like, hey, we get it. She's home. She has nowhere to go. So, um, and then 1902 would require DHS to provide uh, caseworker services to homeless people instead of having to rely so much on these outside organizations who are limited in their budgeting and they're strained with their, you know, caseload. Right. So one case we can have like 20 people. She goes and sees. She has to like you know take into account individuality. Yeah. She has to form a relationship with each of these people. You know her job is to try to come into the shelter. Mm -hmm. So she's patient. She's reassuring. My caseworker was amazing. I seriously think whoever trained her, however she got to where she is, should be set as a standard for pretty much all home services because she wasn't judgmental. She listened. I rambled. She listened. We were there for hour. Our first meeting, an hour and a half. Okay, but she, she listened. She, she, I didn't want to do the traditional family. I'm doing RV and travel, right? And that's outside the, 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 the when they went to housing, like, you know, that's the goal is to get you affordable housing and income, whatever. But I was like, no, I want to save and go an RV. And you know what? She said, we're going to work with you. We're going to work on it. So it, it was just, it just opened my eyes to like how she's the only one that I've had that like experience with and everyone else is just like, uh, it just, it just, yeah, that, that needs to be. Very important. And then, um, okay, the last thing I wanted to just say was that all, everything that's been said today is, is true and wonderful, but the real solution to ending homelessness in general and um, ending pets, people with pets being on the streets is, is the stigma around people with pets on the streets. The stigma is that pets are a luxury. They're a privilege. You know what I'm saying? So if, you, if you're on the streets with your dog, that dog is suffering. He's suffering because he's not living, he's being forced because your choice, he's now suffering because he has no choice, he has no voice, he can't. And I, I used to get into arguments or people would say stuff and I just stopped replying. I would just sit there like, ignore them. Because they literally are so upset that I have the audacity to have him out here. I should give him up to a good home, okay? If I really love my dog, I had this woman give me a card for Pitbulls, Pit with that, um, what is that organization that takes Pit, oh, I forgot what it's called, but it was like um, the bully club. It's like they specialize in, you know, and they're like, if you really love your dog, you'll give him, you know, you'll call. You'll call this number. They'll take him. They'll give him back to you. you all you have to do is sign this paper. She literally sat there for 30 minutes trying to convince me. And I'm like, I'm not fucking stupid. That's called um, releasing my rights, okay? I'm surrendering. That's a surrender form. I didn't say anything. I was just looking at her because she had a 20 in her hand. So I was just like, yeah, okay, yeah, totally. I'm, but she gave me the 20, and I walked off. I'm not going to... But she felt like Oreo was better off in some shelter with a bunch of other pitbulls instead of with me. And it was like, she was trying to like coerce me into it, like sign the surrender form, they'll give them back to you. But you know, I'm smart, I'm like, I know what was going on, but you know, and I got you $20, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> so anyways, what I'm trying to say is that, um, you know, um, yeah, so the stigma is the main thing. So I don't know, I, I'm interested in trying to like change that. However, you know, like let, let people know, like my model for everything I do in life has come to, things are not always as they seem. It's that simple. You think you know, but you have no idea. You see someone, you think this, you don't, you don't know what they're going through. You know, I, no, I, can't, I can't imagine what people go through. And they walk around holding that with them. But I'm on the ground, on the cement. My life is out on display. You know what I have for breakfast. You know what kind of, you know, you know that I've worn those same pants for three days. And that's all on display. So therefore, you have given yourself the right to judge me, to criticize me. And that's the problem. Like, <laughs> it's the problem because I, I learned through my being homeless that I, there is, 
there is no like mostly white people are nice to me mostly older white ladies are nice no muslim people give me money like older black people young black people like the most surprising people you know what i'm saying and i, I learned from that i don't judge no more I, being on the streets the one thing i walk away from is i don't judge anymore I don't judge. I used to be friends with, I had a friend that was a crackhead. I had a friend who, um, you know, did other drugs, you know? I sat there with a heroin addict and trying to convince her to go to the hospital and get her arm looked at because she missed the vein. I didn't judge her. I wasn't sitting there looking at her like, you're, just, you're fucking pathetic. Why would you do that? I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I stopped judging. I'm, I will never judge anybody again. So I just feel like that's something that, I don't know, like, how, like the city can do, like, some type of, informative campaign, you know, like they do the thing with the subway, like you said, the deferred program. Yeah, I mean, it's a good... Right, like, uh, they do it for other stuff, like... Yeah, it's, in a, it's a good note to end on. I remember it's going down the subway station and making, <laughs> trying to sleep because I was so tired. Um, it was really windy, and um, yeah. like an hour later, there's like four homeless outreach cops saying that I have to leave. Someone took a picture of me and sent it to them. And I'm like, okay, you know, and I'm just sitting there, and they stand there chit-chatting among themselves, watching you. They will not leave until you leave. Every last thing is gone. So you're sitting there and you're like, you just had like an hour of sleep, you're exhausted, and Oreo's sitting there, he's looking at him like, I'm just trying to get him out bay and then I'm trying to get my stuff, and it's, yeah, so it's like, you know, yeah, yeah. there has to be, no, yeah, I know, I know, yeah, but, but, but the stigma is the issue. That's not less, less, right. less you be judged. Yeah, because, and then there's the go, that goes back to, there's, you know, different types of homeless people. There's the ones that don't shower, haven't showered in months. There's the ones like me who do like to shower. There's the ones who, you know, it's whatever. I'll do a bird bath, did bird baths for years. And so by looking at them, they're like, oh, that homeless person, he's dirty, he, he's wearing dirty clothes. But me, I'm clean, I'm well-spoken. You know how many times I've been told that? I'm well-spoken, I'm clean. Why are you out here? Oh, because I don't look like that, I'm more worthy of not being out here? So the stigma is the biggest issue, and I, I know it's, it's a very complicated thing to tackle, but I mean, there's got to be a way to, to, yeah. to let people know yeah. that, that it's not what you think. And I, I watch a lot of videos, and I'm not, I'm not going to ramble, but uh, there's a series on YouTube where this guy interviews homeless people. He says, Christine, the crack addict. And she sits there, and he just... She talks about her life. And through the end of the video, you're like, you have no whole new outlook. Yeah. She looks rough, right? But then you, you hear her whole story and you're like, yeah. wow, Christine, how did you survive all that, you know? So I don't know, maybe that can be oh, these are, yeah. an option. No, no, thank you. I appreciate all of your testimony. Thank you, I'm sorry, I know. It's just, it's a yeah. lot, but. Yeah, no, but thank you so much. It, it, ignorance, ignorance is yeah. the problem, you yeah. know, the ignorance of, of not knowing and just, yeah. people are afraid of what they don't understand, so that's the problem. Thank How do we fix that, though, you know? Yeah, 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 it's a challenge. Thank yeah. you, though. Thank All right, that's so it. Um, everyone's Thank leaving. <laughs> Bye. Um, okay, well, thank you, everybody, for, uh, for your testimony, for being here um, at 326. This hearing is adjourned.